This evening we have one counselor attending via remote participation. Councillor Haneke has petitioned and received permission to, to, to participate in that manner, giving physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult. This is permissible under 940CMR 29.105. Um, let the record reflect that board committee members, Councillor Mandy Jo Haneke is attending remotely via speakerphone for the meeting of February 11th, 2019, because it would be unreasonably difficult, which is permissible. Mandy Jo, can you hear me? Yes. I was very clear. <laughs> um, let, let the record reflect that member Councillor Mandy Jo Haneke's attendance based speakerphone can be heard by all present at the meeting and some of those even further away. <laughs> it's pretty loud. Um, all votes taken during a meeting with a remote participant shall be by roll call vote. Therefore, at, as all votes, at all votes, the town count clerk will ask for the individual votes. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, I will suspend discussion while reasonable efforts are made to correct the problem. If remote participation is disconnected, that fact and time of disconnection uh, will be recorded in the meeting minutes. I have asked each count the I have asked Mandy Joe in advance to provide uh, with any agenda items that she would like to reasonably speak to, and Councillor Ross will indicate that the councillor participating remotely wishes to speak in this case. Thank you. Um, remote counselors are to speak by stating their name. Uh, you will be acknowledged, but they won't speak until called upon. Usual time limits apply. So, seeing that we have a quorum, I call the meeting of the town council to order at 6.32. Um, welcome all. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live and being recorded by Amherst Media. Copies of the agenda are projected on the wall in the meeting room and were posted in advance of the meeting. If you are interested in speaking during the meeting, please sign the sheet at the side of the room over at this table. I have a couple of announcements. First of all, on February 13th, 2019, Amherst will mark its 260th anniversary. On that date, an act for erecting the second precinct in the town of Hadley in the county of Hampshire into a district by the name of Amherst was passed by the Great and General Court of Massachusetts. Second, tonight we begin our education on major capital projects, although we have had a preview on the schools. At the town council meeting on Monday, February 25th, the council will discuss various funding scenarios for major capital projects. And we hope that you, both listening at home and in the audience, will join us for this educational period in our time. There will be school listening sessions where both town councilors and Amherst school committee members will be present. And those sessions have been publicized they will not be official district meetings that we, as we originally had intended. Uh, just scheduling would not allow that. Uh, but they will be two meetings on February 27th, two on February 28th, and one on March 6th. The school building application to the Mass Massachusetts School Building Authority will come before the town council for discussion on Monday, March 18th and for a vote on Monday, April 1st. One other date to put on your calendar, we will hold a public forum as required by the charter on the budget. At that time, we will be meeting on Thursday, March 7th at the middle school. And as, it, as with all public forums, half of the time is devoted to public comment. Speaking of public comment, <laughs> Public comment and the agenda have been rearranged. So the council wishes to thank you for your patience as we've organized. And as counselors, we want to communicate 
that we have heard you. Many counselors and the public have asked that we move public comment earlier in the evening. In addition to that, the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee has proposed a trial rearrangement of, of an agenda. This is our second trial and includes movement of public comment earlier as well as rearranging agenda items. In setting the agenda, I have taken into careful consideration the following. The report forwarded by that committee, my strong desire to personally move public comment earlier, my serious reservations about having what could be five or more public comment periods on one agenda, and a request by some counselors to end meetings much earlier than midnight. Finally, <laughs> public comment to the town council meeting, at town council meetings is only one way, to, we, and we invite you to communicate with us. However, there are others. You can email us at towncouncil at amherstma.gov. You could send us individual emails with our last name and then our first initial at the same address. You can come visit us during office hours, which we're organizing. Some counselors have done a better job of that than others. And you can come to district meetings, which we'll have at least two a year, in fact, maybe even more. And whenever my husband lets me go grocery shopping and doesn't expect me to return for several hours, you can talk to me there. <laughs> I had to just enter that. It's been a family joke for years. So with no hearings, we're moving on to public comment. General public comment on matters other than those under agenda items 5A, 5B, and 6 or frankly others. We will have public comment after those items, 5A, 5B, and 6. Public comments on those will be taken at the relevant time after the council has had their initial discussion. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to one to three minutes. I'll decide on how long when I see how many people wish to speak. And um, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. So, the floor is open for general public comment. May I see it? the hands of those who would wish to speak? I say two hands. Let's start with the gentleman in the front, Mr. Kuzner. You have to push the button. Thank you and good evening. Uh, Rob Kussner, and um, it's nice to join you here in quorum. And to the absent member who's joining us remotely, I wish you were here because I signed my letter with a pen that you'd recognize the color on. It's a nice purple flare pen. Anyway, um, I don't know if the letter that I put together about an hour ago was distributed. If it is, then it I'm happy just to let you read it and keep my comments very brief. Um, this is an opportunity for town council to show what uh, I think proponents of this system of government uh, had promised, namely the nimbleness of local government. We're now um, seven months into fiscal year, maybe eight months, depending on how you count, fiscal year 2019. Last spring, we were aware that the governor's budget for public transportation funding to the non-MBTA regional transit authorities, the largest of which is the PBTA that serves us here in western, you know, in the Pioneer Valley, um, was going to cut the transit support by about $8 million. Happily, some of that was restored by the legislature during the summer but not enough of it was restored in a way that was, shall we say, non-strings attached for those funds to reappear in the budgets of the transit providers like UMass Transit. Um, so we're in a situation where last spring, our legislature at the time overwhelmingly approved a supplemental appropriation that would help alleviate some of the service cuts that we've just experienced in this past month and that we're going to experience in a much bigger way starting in May once the summer break for the colleges begins. And those cuts affect some types of public transit services that are happening every day of the week during the daytime. 
just as the sun is setting on every summer evening, the two main core bus routes are going to stop running till the next morning. And the service cuts are even worse on weekends. And in general, PBTA service is lighter in the summer. Given our interest in reducing our impact on climate change and other environmental consequences of driving private vehicles, I hope we'll renew our commitment, one that this town and our five college neighbors have committed to for nearly five decades now, our commitment to supporting public transportation locally. I hope that this council will consider two actions and done in tandem, I think they'll allow us, A, to restore those transit cuts, and B, send a message to the future that we really care about transit in Amherst. And I outlined them in, in items one and two below. One is to follow the lead of five colleges, Five Colleges Incorporated. They've committed to increase their contribution to the PVTA system by $50,000 a year for each of the next five years. It's a long-term commitment, which is something that PVTA likes to see when it agrees to create or restore transit services. They want to have something that's in place for a long time. And following up on that, if the town can commit in a resolution, it can't be formally done in the budget that far in advance, but I think a, a resolution showing a good faith commitment would go a long way to the showing um, that we care about transit and PVTA would respond to that. But then I, I ask you to encourage the manager our PBTA representative and us, uh, citizens who care about transit and who rely on transit, to work with PBTA to make use of the supplemental budget that the town appropriated to restore these transit services uh, during this summer. And that could be done in the FY19 budget. So thank you for the time. I'm sorry that uh, I haven't sent this to you by email yet, but now I know the email address. I'd forgotten it, and it'll come to you probably as soon as I get back to work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The gentleman in the back, please come forward and state your name and restrict your comments to three minutes. My name is Bill. I am a resident of the Ann Whalen. Uh, 260 years ago, this town was perhaps charming. 25 years ago, it was certainly charming. It is now moving inexorably toward uh, what might be termed the desolation of modernity, and uh, it is my impression that every square centimeter of the town will be five-story high-rises, uh, apartment high-rises. I was in Boulder attempting to clean it up many years ago, and the same phenomenon occurred. It's no longer a... Uh, and, <clears throat> and habitable environment. And I would like to propose again that the five-story construction be limited to the other side of town, the, the uh, Kendrick Park side as opposed to the Sweeter. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Were there any other public comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on with our agenda. We have a variety of public, capital public projects that are going to be discussed tonight. I mentioned before that we have already had a discussion with the schools about the possibility of a new school building, and then we're Tonight, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bockelman and ask that he introduce this piece of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to put this in context a little bit. Um, Town of Amherst has not built a new building in 30 years. We have pent up demand for significant capital investment. I think uh, you have seen our buildings and have uh, internalize the need for new buildings. We've, we've seemed to have taken, um, built buildings in little bunches. Like 30 years ago, we built the police station. 40, just one yeah. second. Mandy Joe, are you still connected? 
Yes, sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So 30 years ago, we haven't built a new building in this town in 30 years. Uh, we built the police station. 45 years ago, we built a number of our three elementary schools plus the North Fire Station. 70 years ago, we built the Banks Community Center. 90 years ago, roughly, uh, the Jones Library and the Munson Building. And then 120 years ago, we built the Town Hall, the Fire Station, and the DPW. The Town Hall was renovated in 1998. So what we wanted to show you tonight is uh, with the new council coming in, it's an opportunity for the town to begin addressing these significant capital needs. But the first thing we have to do is say, are they really needs and why are they needs? And to tell you what has happened since these needs have come to, the, to fruition. So tonight, the intent is for us, for the library director, the fire chief, and the DPW superintendent to lay out what the problem is with the buildings where we are in the process for replacement, and uh, entertain any questions that you may have on the conceptual needs, not really talking about the funds, because that, as the President said, is coming up at the next meeting and will be discussed at the Finance Committee, committee meeting as well. So, um, so that's, that's the, to lay the groundwork for the, uh, tonight. Um, and so the concept that we have been working on is something that uh, I've been calling a uh, one town, one plan. We need to address, take on all these capital projects plus the things that we have, that the council has identified like investment in roads and other smaller investments, uh, maintenance that we have to do in terms of roofs and things like that, and uh, come to a um, consensus, as the superintendent had talked about, about how we can afford what we uh, can do and what is our plan over the next several decades because it's not a five-year plan or 10-year plan. It's a decades-long plan. So this is our first foray and just trying to share information. There are a lot of slides. Our presenters know that they're going to, especially the DPW and fire, they have lots of slides to show you. They're going to go fast, so don't worry when you see the, the number on there. Um, and the other thing that we were, that the DPW superintendent will do is sort of lay out what's it take to build a public construction project. So you can see the steps that have to be required, that have to be followed in order for us to build a new, new building. So first I will ask the library director, Sharon Sherry, to come up and do her presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I wanted to start by introducing uh, the library trustees that are in the room tonight. Uh, Austin Serrett, the president of our trustees, is back there. Uh, Tamsin Ely. Uh, Chris Hoffman. I think, I hope I'm not missing. Okay. Um, here we go. Founded in 1921. The Jones Library quickly became one of the iconic institutions in Amherst. Samuel Lynott Jones' bequest enabled a town of 5,500 to build a library that was regionally celebrated in its day because it exemplified the central role the library should play in a town with Amherst's unique values and interests. More than just a place, a cozy place to read a book, the Jones Library welcomed all its citizens to the town's cultural heart. Fast forward to today's project, it's been in the works for over seven years, and the specific design proposal is the result of almost three years worth of planning by about 20 members of the community, along with several architectural professionals in dozens of open meetings. So I thought we'd put this project through a SOAR strategic planning analysis, talk about, talking about its strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. So starting with our strengths, what does our building do well? Amherst is special. Uh, it takes great pride in its unique character. It's the land of the book and the plow. And Amherst Town Library is also special. We are already more heavily patronized than any other library in the state except Springfield and 19 other Boston area libraries. Uh, 
We serve over 250,000 visitors and circulate almost 500,000 items every year. In addition, the 1921 founders had a radical vision that the library can play a central role in supporting the character of a town. Thus, the Jones was designed and built to look like a house. It originally included a 250-seat theater for performances, concerts, lectures, and movies, and an art gallery to offer area artists and craftspeople a public space in which to exhibit their work and encourage appreciation and understanding of art. The Jones has gone through several transformations in its time, but two of them were quite substantive in that they drastically changed the look and feel of the original 1928 building. The first large-scale renovation was in the late 1960s. Planning began and money was secured in 1966, and the work was done in 67 and 68. This renovation removed the auditorium seating area, the stage became a mezzanine with additional shelving, and a floor was added above the auditorium seating area that became the Burgess Fine Arts Room. In the basement, the stage coach was removed, along with a coal bin to make space for more shelving. Studios for painting, ceramics, and weaving replaced a catalog room and a youth activity room. Planning for the second major renovation began in 1988. It was an important expansion renovation project. The trustees received an MBLC construction grant in 1991, and the, and the work was finished in 1993. This renovation, which undid some of the 1960s work, added 12,000 square feet to the building. It removed the stage and the Burgess Room, restoring the height of the current fiction room. It removed the art studios, updated heating and cooling systems, updated lighting, improved handicapped accessibility, created the Woodbury meeting room space and the back entrance. It also created the atrium, added space for the ESL program, and created the dedicated space for special collections. Opportunities, what circumstances can we leverage for success? The last renovation of the Jones that I just talked about followed a plan intended to serve the library for 20 years. And now in 2019, all of the building systems have come to the end of their life cycles, and it's time for the Jones physical plant needs to be addressed. We need to become substantially greener, improve overall energy efficiency, and replace the atrium that's too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, and leaky year round. We can no longer fulfill our historic mission. We offer a terrific set of activities and programs which makes us a community building hub but the present facility does not allow us to serve large portions of the population, including those who are mobility impaired, children and families, the current spaces that are allocated towards to children's needs, whether for activities or simply reading aloud, are inadequate to the demand. Almost 7,000 children attend activities annually, and parents often have to leave because all the reading spaces in the building are already taken. Teenagers, there is no dedicated space for teens in our, in our building, either to work on collaborative school projects or to gather when the school buildings are closed. We should be eager to attract them to their own space in the library instead of to the, to the streets or de facto to the unsupervised stacks of the basement of the current building. Those learning English, 25% of those in Amherst schools come from families whose first language is not English. We need to provide welcoming quarters for English language learners through our recognized ESL program that meets the needs of this growing Amherst demographic. And those needing access to computers, 33% of Amherst residents live below the poverty level. And the Jones computer terminals are regularly oversubscribed, reflecting the dramatic change in the ways knowledge and culture is being shared and transmitted. Library computers are an especially important lifeline for the growing population of the town that cannot afford a computer at home. There are also safety issues that we have to address in this building due to a severe sack of staff sight lines. The basement, elevators, stairwells, the cozy rooms, and the garden are notorious locations for unwanted activity. And our security cameras are reactive rather than proactive. Once the crime occurs, the damage has already been done. 
And then there's the fact that the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners calls the Jones Library the most dysfunctional public library in the state of Massachusetts. We need to preserve the significant elements of the distinctive look and feel of the original 1928 building while replacing the 1993 addition with spaces, with spaces that are much more user-friendly for both patrons and staff. And I'll take you on a visual tour. So speaking of the building overall, none of the original 1928 building is ADA compliant. And much of the 1993 addition, including the stacks, are no longer up to code. The steep pitch of our roof dumps snow onto the heads of patrons. The six staircases are confusing and unsafe due to lack of staff sight lines. All our building systems need to be replaced. The cobbled together technology is old and inefficient. The chiller compressor is operating at half capacity due to costly repairs that are needed. The pneumatic thermostats are very difficult to calibrate if they work at all. The building is not wired properly for a 21st century library. The overall layout of the building is extremely confusing, as well as many other maintenance issues which need to be addressed, such as stained and faded carpeting and peeling paint and plaster. Speaking more specifically about the different rooms in the building, the children's room is not big enough to handle the demand. There's not enough patron seating there. The nonfiction stacks are too high, they're too close together. The collection is housed on two different floors and that creates a hardship for parents of multiple children. The room is outdated. The cramped children's librarian's office is, in, is located in what should be a gorgeous reading nook. And this, that space contains the only bathroom on the main floor. The Jones adult circulation desk is the worst circulation desk I've ever seen. It is too small for staff, sp staff sp functions and it's not good for customer service. It has three service points, so patrons are never sure whether or not they're standing in the right line uh, and the backs of staff are always facing the patrons. The interlibrary loan room is neither heated nor cooled and it's just not big enough to handle our interlibrary loan delivery of up to 20 bins a day. The atrium roof, it's poorly designed and it has leaked badly since it was installed. Many attempts throughout the years have, to make it watertight have just failed. So we have to keep buckets near the adult circulation de desk to collect the rainwater. In the reference department, there's not enough computers. And this is important because the majority of research materials nowadays are accessed online. The nonfiction stacks in the basement, uh, I consider it's a warehouse for books. The space is not inviting uh, and it's unsafe to be there because there's no staff presence. There isn't enough space for ESL services to meet the demand and it's very difficult to find. Then there's the special collections department which is severely un uh, undersized. The materials which do not fit in that archive are not being stored in climate control spaces. The exhibit room is only open when special collections is open and you have to be buzzed in. There's no, no door on the climate controlled storage area, which is like leaving your doors and windows open at home while you have the air conditioning going. There's not enough room to collect and store additional items. And because this department's location is so far away, it's very difficult to find your way back out of the building. And then there's our telecommunications room, which is really quite scary. Uh, there's a, there's little space for expansion in the room and we have data wiring running through the pipes in our boiler room. So how do we fix all these problems? We again became involved in the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners construction grant program, beginning with the creation of a building program. It's a detailed inventory, ours is six pages long, of all the functions in the library, including the number of books, computers, chairs, and tables for each room. I do want to reiterate that the only reason our project is here before you now is because of the availability of this grant. The MBLC's program only comes around once every 10 plus years, and this is why we have been limiting our JCPC requests over the past few years, because we knew this would be the most cost-effective way to preserve and enhance the library. So we hired Feingold Alexander Architects out of Boston. They are historic preservation experts, and we gave them our program to analyze. Also remember that the Massachusetts legislature has allocated substantial funds specifically for library projects such as ours. Similar funding will not be available again until 
2025 or later. And as I said previously, our project is considered a high priority by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners because they fully understand our building's deficiencies and know that the Jones plays an important role in Western Massachusetts. We are very much a regional library. Through this grant program, the MBLC is returning your tax dollars to Amherst. The architect's work was guided by several principles. They found that they could not solve our problems within the existing 48,000 square foot footprint. The facts show that we must expand to 65,000 square feet. The MBLC publicly stated it will not fund a smaller project. If the town wants to go smaller, the town will have to pay for it on its own. The most efficient way to add square footage to the Jones is by building off the rear of the building rather than by adding up and ad adding an additional floor. Within the past few weeks, our architects have researched again the possibility of going up in order to preserve more of the rear garden. But due to three primary concerns, it has been decided that building up an additional floor is not an option. And the first problem is shown on this slide, massing. So building up another level, as is shown on the picture on your right, it will negatively impact the original structure visually and most likely have trouble getting Massachusetts Historic Commission approval. Secondly, the costs. It would be more expensive to build up. And thirdly, staffing issues. We would need more staff if there were another floor going up. Thus, it was decided that building out to the rear is best, as is shown on the picture on the left. And to be clear, this is the design and the footprint that we submitted in our grant application. The footprint is not getting bigger uh, than what was appro already approved by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And regarding the rear garden, we have preserved 70% of that space. And the final designs will be a result of a community planning process. No landscaping plans have been proposed. Instead, the trustees have appointed a gardens advisory committee, which will help oversee the project. The landscaping is already included in the project's budget, and the plan is for the existing plants to be moved or replaced in accordance with the community's plan. And on to aspirations. What do we want to achieve in the future? We are looking for a building that can be used by everybody in town. Teens, people with mobility issues, the financially disadvantaged, and non-English speakers a building which better needs the needs of traditional book borrower, borrowers and encourages user independence with more visible and efficient circulation services, and a building which attracts the interests of the next generation of library patrons, is safe and has clear signage so patrons feel comfortable navigating the building, preserves our history, including the refurbishment of the wood floors and the fireplaces and the beautiful wood paneling, and safeguards our future by being green, offers plenty of collaborative and silent spaces, and has windows and comfortable seating on every floor overlooking the gardens. And what are the tangible outcomes we'll see that demonstrate we've received, we have achieved our goals? The architects tried to find a good combination of preserving the look and feel of the original building and designing a new addition that is open and adaptable. The designs shown here are very much still a work in progress, and that's why they're so small here. The MBLC is requiring that we move the large meeting room from the first floor uh, to a different spot. Uh, so thus, there's going to be a ripple effect throughout all of the designs. But in the end, what we're looking for is a front entrance that's handicapped accessible. All of the children's services will be on one floor, so families have easy access low shelving in the children's room so the kids can reach their books on their own, a children's activities room on the same floor as the collections, a story time nook, uh, the young adult room, which will be bright and welcoming and encased in glass walls so they can be noisy but we can still see them. It will be filled with technology and their collection of materials. Restrooms on all the floors, the circulation desk will have very clear points of service. Uh, there will be a book return that doesn't overflow so the police department won't get phone calls anymore. And plenty of computers as well as group study rooms. The large Woodbury room will almost double in size. It will have windows and can be used for meetings and events even when the library is closed. 
The entire special collections collection will be stored in a truly climate controlled space and the exhibits will be open to everyone during all library hours. We are also making room for the town's refurbished Civil War tablets. Regarding aesthetics, the trustees are firmly committed to maintaining the homey feel of the Jones Library. It's up to the architects to combine the wonderful historic feel of the Jones along with the updated technological services that we need to provide to our patrons. Regarding the interior appearance, the MBLC does not care about aesthetics. It's up to each individual community to decide on the look and feel of their public library. So that's why design development, we haven't been through it yet. That doesn't happen until after the grant is received and the town has approved its share of project costs. And regarding the exterior appearance, the entire facade of the 1928 building will be kept as it is, except for some protection of, from, of the front door from ice and snow. And the appearance of the new addition is not yet determined. There's going to be a balancing act with the budget, primarily between historic preservation and uh, LEED certification. And you'll be hearing more about the budget uh, for the project. The total cost is 35.6 million, uh, with 13.7 coming from the MBLC, 6 million coming from private donations and historic tax credits, and 15.9 coming from the town. And what if the project isn't approved? Well, passing on this grant is not going to prevent expenditures. Because of our deferred maintenance needs, we could easily spend millions and get nothing for it. So for a moment, let's say we've solved all our collection space problems. We've weeded our collections to the fullest. Patrons are using the ILL system more heavily and we've properly climate controlled our, store, our special collections materials. We are now housing our entire mystery and science fiction collection in the basement of another town owned building. Let's say we've now made enough room at the Jones for a teen room and ramps have been added so that staff with mobility issues can get to the staff bathrooms one could say that most of our problems have been solved, except they won't be. Millions of dollars will still need to be spent replacing all of the building's outdated systems. All of our systems have come to the end of their lifespan and need to be re redesigned and replaced. We are in the same boat on a smaller scale as the schools. If the town votes down the grant, the trustees will have to go through the JCPC process over several years probably, in order to fix many expensive problems. Our immediate needs are labeled phase number one on the left side of this slide. The fire alarm, sprinkler, and burglar alarms need to be replaced. The atrium has to be entirely removed, redesigned, and rebuilt. No matter what, it cannot be repaired. The HVAC system needs to be entirely removed, redesigned, and rebuilt. It cannot be repaired. The slate roof has to be repaired. Most of the windows, all the carpeting needs to be replaced. The front elevator needs to be replaced to make it accessible. And the entire interior needs to be repainted. Also, several of these individual projects will trigger a domino effect. For example, if we replace the glass atrium, we'll also need to replace the HVAC system to avoid heat-created ice dams. So as you can see, phase number one is a no-frills list. According to the, 19, the, the, 2000 and the 2017 cost estimate, it's gonna cost a, mil, a minimum of $10.7 million to do the work in phase one. And that $10.7 million figure does not include the phase two work listed on the right side of the slide. We do not have a cost estimate for the phase two work because we would have had to hire an architect to get that cost estimate and architects are expensive. Um, and after going through the JCP, JCPC process, the resulting structure will still lack sufficient space and will still not be entirely up to code because without a substantial redesign, several areas will still not be handicapped accessible, but it will have cost the town almost the same amount of money as if it had taken advantage of the grant. Also, dealing only with the library's deferred maintenance accessibility and code requirements will create some of the same hardships as going through an entire expansion renovation project because we'll still need to relocate temporarily while the work is being done. But the result will not be the 21st Century Learning Center that Amherst needs. 
We believe it would be a mistake to spend $10 million on repairs when before us lies such an incredible opportunity for so much more. The trustees oppose, propose that the town accept the state grant. Our goal is to spend $16 million after private fundraising of town money so that Amherst can have the library it needs, a library which will last long after you and I are gone. The beauty of this grant is that we'll get all our systems replaced and we'll have everything else our patrons want, including safety, security, common sense flow, bathrooms on all levels, lots of natural light, green technology, and historic preservation. I'm gonna end here with the uh, estimated timeline that you've seen before. We're expecting an FY21 grant announcement, an FY22 uh, town council approval, uh, FY23 construction would begin and construction would end in FY25. Thank you. Are there specific questions to Sherry at this time from the council? Kathy? Thank you for the presentation and also what has clearly been a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, I want to start out a bit where uh, uh, town manager Paul Bachman introduced in terms of thinking the whole town, that we need one plan that fits the whole town. And given our restricted, very restricted budgets, um, if we line up all the big projects, I think we're going to have to focus on needs, really, with a laser beam, and not go to wants. So we might have an ideal situation if we had a lot of money to, to hone down. So I want to ask a little bit more about the fixing the Jones side of it, um, which I understand you couldn't just go for a grant. You have to do the expansion. You know, so you expand the proposed project increases the total size by about 35% and demolishes the new wing that was added. So it's a major construction project as well as a renovation. Um, I went on your website, so I think the renovation estimates were from Western Builders. Did I get the right the download? So, you know, it, it had a, you could either phase it in or you could do it all at once. Um, and as you had pointed out, it didn't do certain kinds of things in their estimate. It, their costs were a little bit lower on the website than what you showed here, about a million lower. So I'm not sure about the difference, but say it's in the 10 or 11 range. So I, I think if I'm looking at the numbers right, that if we got a grant, the town share would anywhere be for an, anywhere from around six million to more, even with the grant, than it would be in repairing and renovating. And when I say or more, you need to raise another six million dollars. So I'm, what happens if you don't raise the money and we're in the middle of the building project is sort of like, that's where I, 16 million is where you think you're gonna be. So I have a, how much of the urgent need could be met by the repair and renovation in a phased way, the JCPC route, rather than an entire building project? So I, um, that's, that's what I was talking about with the, um, the phase one, that's the $10 million estimate, so that's just for those items. Those are the immediate needs. Okay. And, and could, could we as a town be living with a functioning library for several years with that type of expenditure? Um, oh, uh, well, certainly. Any, you know. The town can live with whatever library uh, it is going to, you know, put into it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're living in it now, even without anything being done to it. Are there other questions? Yes, Dorothy. Dorothy, um, husband's <clears throat> conflict. Excuse me? Oh, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you that my, my husband, Bob Pam, who is a trustee of the library, can't be here tonight because he's babysitting. We couldn't be in two places, at, he couldn't be in two places at once, but he does wish he were here. Um, so I do agree with you that the town's public library is something that expresses, in a way, the soul of the town. 
And um, I, hearing the details of the atrium, in my mind, I had kept hoping that that could be repaired or we could keep the sense of the large, gracious space and maybe remove some of the stacks and have something that some people refer to as a, the town's living room. But you're saying that, that from the very beginning it was not, did not work, that it leaked. Um, is there any plan for some kind of space in the library that would be one for people to come and to sit and to reflect and to be able to perhaps talk to somebody but um, in a quiet way? Um, a public space of, of an informal type. Yeah, I, I think what we uh, have been working on with the architects is exactly a nice mixture of total, having some totally quiet spaces and having some more noisy spaces and having those spaces in between. Um, so yeah, that's the opportunity that's before us. Thank you. Steve. So what was the date of the addition? The addition the, uh, the, most, the most recent yeah. one, it ended in 93. So technically that's the newest building. So the finished after the police stations. But it's an interesting study in the tale of two buildings, right? So the Jones edition, you know, by all accounts is, well, no, I'm sorry, by a lot of accounts is, you know, it feels worn out for many reasons. And the you know, the police station, not that I've been in there that often, you know, <laughs> you know it simply feels, um, you know, it feels more solid. But I think it's an interesting case study in value engineering. So we, we had the, the, the original architect is, is for the, the owner of the firm has passed away, but one of his helpers came to UMass last year and talked about, she talked about, um, kind of the original scheme for the 1993 edition and really what happened in the value engineering process. So at, you know, I wasn't around at the time, but as far as I understand it, in order to meet a budget, a lot of things were cut. And I think it's those cuts that then made the current Jones as a whole really not function to the highest degree possible. So I mentioned that in part because it's a lesson going forward but also in part because people, so many people ask the question, why are we tearing down something? Or why is there a proposal to tear down something that's only, I can't do the math. Um, 26. 26 years, years old. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Evan. I feel like you said this, but I, I may have forgotten it. The 10.7 million. Is uh, your mic on? It is, okay. I, can, I can hold it closer. Uh, that 10.7 million, that's just that deferred maintenance list. Does that include, is there an ability to deal with some of the concerns over space for English language learners or teens within that 10.7 million, or is that strictly those? Yeah, the 10.7 million is just the items in that list. It doesn't, it doesn't add space anywhere. It's just fixing things. So, uh, when we ask the question, is this something that we could live with, um, that would mean we would still be facing the problems of not having sufficient space to serve our underserved communities, English language learners, teens, low-income people, correct? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Kathy? I, I just want to follow up on that. Have you, um, you did a nice walkthrough with me of all the different rooms in the library. Um, has there, was there a step at which you said, suppose we reconfigure the use of our current space to build on Evans? You know, could yeah, we before we got involved. Use this space for teens and move something else over here, um, move things around? Yeah, so that was a part, of, a part of my spiel. Let's say that we've taken care of all our space issues by you know, weeding heavily and, and you know, off-site storage and, and all of that stuff. You've still got to spend well over $10 million to fix the building problems. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Pat. Uh, the, off, uh, the off site storage, is that uh, fee, uh, are fees required with that, that we would be paying for appropriate storage? Uh, yeah, I mean, depending on where it went, um, I, 
Yeah, so I, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my son assuming, worked... assuming I'd have to rent space somewhere, I mean, that would in essence be creating a third branch and I'd have to pay for heating, that, electricity, yeah. and all of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I was in the library recently and I was in the lower level and I discovered uh, by talking to some people that that's where the teens go. And uh, it, I, if I were a teen, would actually like the space, but it's completely unsupervised um, and it's not really safe. So I do think you need a new teen space. Um, I do have a question, uh, and that is, would you have to vacate the library under either circumstance, a total renovation because you're adding an addition, or the just the repairs? Uh, so I'm just a librarian. But yeah, if we do a complete renovation, the plan is to uh, be located in an interim space for the duration um, so that it can be done quickly and safely. Um, uh, as far as the, um, you know, for example, if, you, if we have to rip out the atrium, mm -hmm. I, I would think we would have to close the library because it's right smack dab in the, in the middle of the space and, you know, right. to get to the bathrooms and things like that. So, um, yeah, we'd have to be located somewhere else no matter what. And is the cost of relocation and, remo and moving back in this estimate? It's in the grant budget estimate, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Shalini? So in the slide with the opportunities, um, do you have a sense, so I'm sure you do, uh, which um, services are currently being utilized the most and which ones would you know, be facilitated better if, with the new space? I, I th the children's services are definitely utilized the most, I believe. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I want to say what we're proposing is doubling or tripling the size of the children's department and um, so that families can really come and have all their needs taken care of. And yeah, thank you. Good. Can I just follow up with yes. that? Then um, so many, the other areas that, that we are attributing to the new building, would those really be needed if, um, uh, I would say yes. Uh, so if you're a teenager, you need to be in a teen space. And So are those, I mean, I'm just trying to just get a sense of what what is the most value we'll get out of the expansion. So what are the services that will be most used? So we may create space for teenagers, but are they coming? Or what can we do perhaps to, to make sure? You know, oh, so the teenagers are definitely coming. Um, so... You know, when I started working here, the headline in the newspaper was always, there's a teen problem at the Jones, and that's a shame. The, teen, the word teen should never be put next to problem. Uh, the fact that these teenagers are coming to the library is the coolest thing in the whole wide world. Um, and so the trustees and I, we, uh, we hired a young adult librarian, so we, actually, we have an actual position now. And if you do th things with these kids, um, they will be successful library users, and they will, will grow up knowing that being in a library is good and, and, and they're not being given dirty looks and, um, and they can eat and they can make noise because these are not, they're not children and they're not adults. They're, their brains are not fully formed yet. We want them to be teenagers and they deserve their own spaces and they are our patrons. Okay. Are there other questions at this time? I failed to mention, we are going to take public comment at the end of all of the capital projects. I hate to do that to you, but otherwise we would have public comment at six different times tonight. So um, I do want to ask one other question, you, uh, and this is actually a point of information. The library is not, quote, owned by the town. It's certainly part of the town. Therefore, it is not subject to the zero energy bylaw. However, I heard you mention lead certification, which yeah. Some people debate whether that's the way to go or not, but yeah. uh, and but I gather that is also in your plan. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Good evening. 
Good evening. If I scan, will that actually black what you're seeing in the back of the screen? No. So we need to hear. Hmm? What'd you say? We need to be closer to the microphone that we can hear. Right. Guilford, you do need to be close enough to the microphone so we can hear. Yes. Did you know these toys are in the back? <clears throat> and you can like do a karaoke thing here if you wanted to and have a really good time with this. Um, uh, I actually do this better when I stand up and I apologize if that makes people uncomfortable but I do like it a little better. So um, I was asked to go over some of the classroom work that many of the town staff members have to go through to learn how to do these projects and to be certified to do these projects. Um, the Inspector General's office controls procurement in the state and they've come up with a program called the MCPPO program, which is the Massachusetts Certified Public Procurement Officer Program. There's about four of us in the town, and I think there's now five of us in the town who are certified in this, and there's one in the school. Um, it's kind of a thing that's catching on, and a lot of people are being certified because it keeps us from breaking the rules, which was actually really popular about the time when they were building a lot of additions at UMass in Boston. Yes. If you want to look it up, you can look up, look up the Ward Commission. And a lot of what I talk about has come out of the Ward Commission findings and go way back to when they were building and giving contracts to buddies and giving gifts to buddies and friends and family and people were doing all this stuff. So that's why we have these rules. Uh, they, are, they do seem quite onerous at times, but uh, they are what they are and this is how we go. Okay, so we're not gonna. So this is basically an overview of how we lay out a, a project. If you're building a building, building projects is in the middle. Building projects are here in the middle. If we're a local government or a state government, we follow the same rules. If the designer fee is over 30,000, or if the project's gonna be over 300,000, we have to do a special way of hiring a designer. It's called the designer selection process. And if we're over $10,000, we have to follow MGL 149, which is a lot of other cool stuff. Uh, this slide actually shows public works. I really was, wish it wasn't there for you because I don't want you to get confused. But these are the rules that control public works type structures and projects. Public works are considered a horizontal construction. You're building things horizontally. Buildings are vertical. And if I switch into that frame of reference, that's what I'm talking about. Buildings go vertical. Public works projects are horizontal. We use a process here in the town called design, uh, plan, design, bid it, and construct it. So it's planning, design, construction. Bid, design, construct, the same thing. So those are words you'll hear a lot. We design it, then we go out to bid it, and then we construct it. There are other ways to do it. They're much more difficult. There's my, many, many, many more requirements on the town if we do it that way. This is a straightforward way of doing it if you have a simple project. If you have a very intricate, Unknown project, you would do it one of the other ways of doing it. This is your basic way of doing the projects. Some definitions. Owner. You are the owners. The town is the owner. As the representative of the town, that's, that's you. As the people of the town, that belongs to you as well, the owners. You define what you want to do. You decide what you're going to do. You define who's going to... Uh, Pay for it, you define how you're going to do it, and make sure we follow the rules. 
That's what the owner's responsibilities are. You can have a construction manager. This is also known as the clerk of the works to people who have been around a little while longer. The construction manager is not required, but you can have one, and that person is, helps the owner make their project and make their project go forward. You may be required to have an owner's project manager. So if your building is more than $1.5 million, you have to have an owner's project manager. If you have an owner's project manager, you have to do designer selection based on the qualifications of the firm, not based on price. You have to ask for the best qualified, choose the best qualified, then negotiate the price, and if you don't like the price and don't like that as that goes along, then you can go to the second qualified. But you have to have a reason why you didn't go with the first qualified. And the first reason cannot be they were just too high. That's not allowed. You can also assign a staff member to do this. In the school projects, we've had a consultant doing this. In the library project, we had a consultant. In the fire and DPW project, and in the library project in North Amherst, we've had a staff member do it because we've still been fleshing these projects out moving forward. You can change to a contracted person at any time in the process. You just have to be careful about making sure you, you do it in synchronization and you don't mess things up a little bit. <clears throat> if any of these projects is over $50 million, we're required to have an owner's representative, which is basically a clerk of the works. You have to have a clerk of the works if this project is going to be more than $50 million. I think we might be getting close now to that number on a couple of projects. The designer. The designer is the person we hire to design the project, lay the project out, bid the project, and help us construct the project. Because it's over the threshold that we talked about earlier, we have to do a qualification-based selection of the designer. You cannot just do it based on bids and price. You have to ask for their qualifications, you have to examine their qualifications, then you have to decide this is going to be the person we want to choose, and then you negotiate the price. Some parts of this process you can do in steps, and you can set the prices, and then they can say whether they want to do it or not. That's only usually in the first part of the process you can set that price. And then the second part you usually have to go with more of the industry standard of what that price should be based on the building you've now come up with. Contractor, if we do this in a simple format, this is the person who builds the building. And it could be the person who builds the building with all his friends, his subcontractors. We will have to have subcontractors in this process because we will have work that's over the threshold for requiring filed sub-bids and to have a definitive sub-bidding project, sub-bidding process, sorry. So bidding this is, is difficult because we have to design it. Then we have to bid subs, and then we bid contractors, take those, and they can bid, use those subs, and then they bid the project. That's kind of how it goes. You can design, the, you can bid this contract if you want to, but then you still have to do filed sub bids and some of that on the sub prior as well. So it's usually subs, then it's the co general contractor that bid it. So it's a, it's a bigger process. It's not like uh, public works projects. We're a little easier. Vertical or horizontal? Yeah, if you think about it, when you go up, it's more difficult. When you're going on the ground, it's easy. It's smooth. You either go downhill or... Okay, sorry. <laughs> this, is the overall <laughs> this is the overall picture for you. Owner, you have your construction manager, which actually you could have, you could have three people over there in your construction manager. You can have your construction manager you choose, you can have your required OPM, and if the project is over $50 million, you can have another construction manager. That's a lot of overhead over there on that side, but you may be required to have some of it. You have your designer. You have your designer who has his specialty people. As we in Amherst, he's definitely going to probably have an environmental specialty person there who's in green buildings and all that type of making sure we meet the green, the zero. Zero energy bylaw. Zero, zero bylaw. Sorry about that. You're definitely going to have the person 
library, you're going to have a library consultant. A fire, you're going to have a fire consultant. And Tim will talk about that. And Mr. Nelson will talk about that a little later. They had, we had a special person who came on board who was, his, his specialty was designing fire things. Uh, storage for uh, OB, um, scuba gear, uh, laundry machines for washing gear so they don't contaminate the whole building. All that stuff, he was an expert at doing that. And then you had the architect who knew how to design the building and put it all together. So your team will be made up of subs in the designer and subs in the journal side. And and then this is just a, sub, a slide that brings back together what qualification-based selection of a designer is. And this is kind of how you do it. You basically are required by those two laws and it's competition based on qualification, not price. Now, if you go to a class and you take one of these classes that the state offers, this whole slide shows about an hour and a half, right? I really condensed it down. <laughs> and actually, this is probably all I took out of the whole class anyhow for that hour and a half. Um, so that's that one. Do we want questions or no? Um, go, I sure, questions specifically on this. Yes, Dorothy. Dorothy. Well, I, I guess I'm quite surprised to hear about this method of bidding. Um, I think New York City, it's, it's competitive bidding and price has a lot to do with it. So who set up this process and who requires it? Is this by choice we're doing this or is this a Massachusetts law? It's, ma it's a Massachusetts law that we have to do designer selection for our designers. It's, if, you want, if you want to look it up, I'll leave it up there. You can go to MGL chapter 7C, go to section 44 and 58. That's actually the section that requires it and talks about it. The selection for the OPM is the other one. Kathy. Does that apply just to the designer side, not to the contractor side? That, does not, that applies to the designer side. When we get into the con contractor side, depending on the price, we may have to have a certified contractor who it has to be told to us the contractor is certified to bid these items, and then we can only choose from those contractors. We can't just choose from a local contractor because he's local, but if he's not certified, he can't bid. Yes, Shelley. So if you had uh, designers who had some, the same qualifications, would, would you then be able to choose based on price? Uh, no. You have to choose based on qualifications first. You cannot look at the price to tie, break a tiebreaker. You have to figure out some way to break the tie without looking at a price. You can say who has the best Friday lunches. Uh, you can right. ask, ask, you know. Yeah, that's, that's what my, how do you define qualifications, I guess? Is well, you'll lot. define qualifications when you start looking for your pro designer. So if you're doing a fire station, do they ha have they done fire stations? How many fire stations have you done in the last five years? How many, so if you get six contract, six designers and they've all done five contractors in the last five years, then you'll go, you need other qualifications. So there's how many have you done? How many have you done on time? What have been the comments from your, um, the people you've worked for? Have they been good comments? Have they been bad comments? You'll actually check those references. So those are all go into the selection process. Check the web. Yes, Steve. So I'm pretty sure that qualification-based selection is a characteristic of all 50 states for choosing architects, professionals, basically architects, engineers. Yes? Um, I'm only certified in this state. No, okay, that's, I'm actually stating that as a fact. <laughs> okay. um, but the other thing I want to mention is that you mentioned the Ward Commission. So the Ward Commission, I was in architecture school. The Ward Commission was in the early 80s. It had to do with scandals, mostly at UMass. Boston. Boston, a little bit of UMass Amherst. And th this entire, this seems very cumbersome, but the fact is there really has not been a m construction scandal in Massachusetts since the Ward Commission. Right. So we've actually, whether there, there is a price to pay for this, but the, the price is scandal free for however, <laughs> I'm terrible at math tonight, so. Having, be, being very familiar with the Mass, UMass Boston situation, basically it was a um, 
whole entire campus built on top of a two-story parking garage, which is no longer able to be used. And the price of trying to make that campus stop sinking is enormous. Yes. And just to note that uh, Ward was the president of Amherst College and that he chaired that commission. Mm. Okay, so Andy. Yes, when you talk about qualifications that we would be, we design the qualifications, we specify what they are, and can we include familiarity with zero net energy construction as part of the qualification? Y yes, you can. You can actually write in there that you want people who have specific experience and qualifications in that field. Other questions on this part of it? Moving on. So I was also, this is another, this is another hour and a half that you go through class. Um, and I'm, I promise you I made it much shorter too. <laughs> so when you're procuring the design contracts, just, they have to be licensed, registered, licensed and registered people in Massachusetts. Um, you cannot have a company from New York come in and do it who, unless they have a license to work in Massachusetts. So that's one of the biggest qualifiers you have, is that these people are qualified and licensed to work in this state. <clears throat> these are the phases and what the designers mostly do. You have the planning phase or feasibility phase. From the feasibility phase, you'll get schematic design documents, and usually those two phases go together. And then you have design development and construction documents. Usually those two go together. There'll be a brief pause usually, but they're kind of lumped together to make the project go well. Then they'll do construction, which is they'll do the bidding process, help us with the bidding, help us put the bids out, make sure all the bidding goes well. And then they'll do contract, construction contract administration for the building, building cycle. There's also the end of this, which doesn't get talked about much, is once you finish the construction, you have commissioning and you have takeover and close out of the project, which is actually a big part. It's lumped into the construction and contract administration, but it's something to think about because as you, the more detailed and the more interesting things you have in your buildings, net zero energy type stuff, the more you wanna make sure that your commissioning aspect of your building is very thorough. You don't want someone to say they just slap solar panels on a bunch of things and they all work fine. You wanna make sure it actually does work fine. So there's a lot of those things that in the end of the project needs to be thought about as well. And just the, it's not talked about much here, so I just want to bring it up. So then pl planning stage is usually confirms what you need and all these things and it's kind of what do you need to make these requirements. You'll see, you saw it in the library, the library they do a, a, a big charts of what they have. You'll see in the DPW and the fire, we actually talk about what we need, what we do, how much space you need for that, what's normal space requirement for the, to have that, and it's all charted together and puts into a big chart. So basically the study does talk about that, puts all that together. Um, it study does come up, and there are places where the study will say, well, you just need to redo your building. You just need to do this. You don't need a new building. I can tell you in the fire and police, fire and DPW studies, it was, uh, you need to do something besides redo your buildings. Um, that was the final outcome of the studies. Your buildings aren't suitable for what you use them for. So out of this stage, you do get schematic designs and preliminary specifications and that really big, really big cost number which scares the bejesus out of everybody because it's so far, it's so preliminary and so far in the future, the building, that they put a lot of, a lot of condition on it and a lot of contingency into it. So much contingency that you say, cut that back, cut that back. <laughs> it really will scare you the number. But this is the preliminary side, and remember, it's preliminary. 
The next phase, you'll go into plans and specifications. We'll actually do detailed plans and specifications for your project, and you get to review those and add, this, add your input into it. And then, again, these are your deliverables, which are just your plans and specifications for bidding. At this point, you're ready to go to bid. And you'll have your final plans, your final specifications, and your 100% cost estimate. You'll also know what people you need to have filed sub-bids from and what professions you don't need filed sub-bids from. And then you go through the bidding process, you bid, you award, you set it up, you start going, you oversee the contract, and you build this building. And then again, I left this, this slide in here, because in this one it shows you that if the designer fees over $30,000, or if your construction is more than $300,000, you have to use the designer selection law, which is MGL 7C 44 and 58. That's required by the state. Okay. And I believe that's. Oh. That's just a, another one, too. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Questions? Okay. Like quick questions on this one? Um, I'm glad you mentioned particularly commissioning the building because when we were working on the zero energy bylaw revision, the issue of commissioning all of the things that are associated with getting the zero energy is a significant piece there. Questions? There will be a quiz. <laughs> So I'm going to take a break now, and the fire chief is going to come up here and talk to you about their fire st station study. Actually, Guilford was the project manager for the feasibility study for the fire station. Yeah, we're on. Oh, okay, cool. So, uh, I guess what I'm, what I, what I'm going to do is just sort of uh, give, give, give you an idea of where we are in the, in the long, long pro 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 process for a new uh, head head quarters. Uh, my my, bud, my buddy here is the uh, as, as I said is kind of kind of the tech tech guy. He kind kind of led, 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 led us through through this. And I kind of like to say that you know. You want to, you want to write the end of the story the story, the story first. Where 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 we're going to end 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 up. This is kind of, kind of what, what this is, this is about. Which which one am I using? This, this one. Oop. We're going to take the show on the road. No? Sorry about that. Ah. Program. So this is um, actually Gil, 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 Gilford talk, talked about about this uh, gen, gen, gentleman named Bob Mitchell, Mitchell came in, and it's, this is uh, as it says it's a need 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 needs assessment. This is one. This is two pages of probably a hundred page doc, doc, document where he goes through all the needs that you would have have for a fire for a fire 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 station. Uh, every nook and cranny, every type of thing that that that, that we do. I mean for for instance here, you have uh, admin, administration uh, walls, uh, and, uh, main miscellaneous space. And we uh, he sat sat down with me and uh, my uh, staff and fire for fire for fighters and went through Every piece of what a new build, building would need, what a, what, what a new new fire 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 firehouse would uh, would need, and he broke broke it down uh, by uh, in square square feet, and it was pretty it was pretty intense. intense. It took us a good week week or so just to kind of go 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 through 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 it all, and then and then he then and then he uh, produced produce a doc, doc document. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're scrolling. Yeah. So, 
So this is, ah, darn it. Yeah, we're, we're good. So this is what, what, we, what he, we uh, came, up, came up, up, up with. And this is what really a modern or an up, an up, an up to date fire, fire, fire station, station to serve our, our, our area, 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 area should look, look, look like. As you can see, uh, you, we've got seven, 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 seven spaces for the ad, for ad, ad, admin, a play, place for the pub, pub, public, and uh, our for, for the fire, for the firefighters. And then, then you have the, uh, I guess, I guess you don't call it the uh, op operational side of, of, of the uh, house. There's another, another rend 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 rendering that shows, shows it on, on, on the proposed site. But this this it gives it gives us an, really enough room to do what we need need need, need to, to do. Again, Gil, Gilbert mentioned that either, uh, both both of our build buildings aren't aren't ad, ad, adequate for what for what what uh, what we're asked we're asked we're asked we're asked, asked, asked to, to do. It's just size uh, lay layout that that type of thing. It, it's just an, an, an inadequate, and this is what a model, a model, a modern fire, 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 fire house, fire station should look, look, look like. Feel free to jump. Oops. Site analysis. It's the part of the pro pro project was to, to find a find 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 an ad ad adequate site. And really, and Amherst, the way the town is laid out sort of, sort of presents a challenge because the town is long and skinny. And if you're going to get in, in, anywhere in town in a reasonable amount, amount of time, you really need to be either some, 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 somewhere along Route 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 6, 16 or along Route 9, some, 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 somewhere there. And because it's so long, it just make make makes sense sense to be uh, uh, south 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 of the town town center, and that uh, and this and this uh, this this uh, show shows a uh, response response times. It's, it's called called a heat a heat map, and it shows just shows 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 response 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 times to different part parts of the town. Uh, the other piece of this is, is the level level level. Legend there that's off off to the side. It's kind of kind of tough tough tough, tough to see, but but that's how, how they they came came out came up with 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 the uh, site. And again, this, uh, the town presents challenges chal chal challenges with roads, streets under the over 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 pa 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 passes that that type type of thing. So again, it's either you're you're along Route Route Nine or you're along one 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 six six sixteen. So that that kind of it didn't really ham hamstring string string it, but it got kind of narrowed 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 down where we 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 might put put, put a new station. And this will give you an idea of the, uh, the rave rave rating scale. It's tough 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 to to see, but uh, there were a number a number of prop properties that uh, that that Bob Bob looked looked at. And each in each uh, was really rated. Can we, can we came up with a total score based on uh, it looks like a, at least 10, 10 criteria, criteria, criteria here. So the, the DPW site came in as 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 at the top, the top site, the site that made the mo most sense based on this criteria, criteria. So I've got a vested interest in him getting a, a, a nice new place. So I can steal his his land, uh, <laughs> but again, uh, a lot of work went went into went into, went into it's a pretty co 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 comprehensive st st study to find out just where we need to need to need to play with place in the state station. So if you can imagine, that this is the uh, D the DBW site. Um, now this is how. This is this is the rendering of how how it it would would, would be laid, laid laid out. This one, this one, here. Oops, that one there. Oh, there we go. So, uh, you know what 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 we would have have is uh, our fire fire engine, engine, engines here, ambulances down here. 
Uh, they, you know, they, uh, truck, 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 truck would go out, out, out this, this way, and ambulances would come out and around here. You know, so it's, it just, it just, just make, makes sense, sense in term, term, terms of uh, efficiency. And uh, firefighter area, area, area would be back here. Add, add, uh, the uh, support for, uh, sections would, would be here. You'd have stores, 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 storage for gear, uh, uh, gear, equipment, uh, med medical supplies. Uh, you'd have 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 a place to de decontaminate gear, uh, de decontaminate our pe people, if that if that if that if that were a need, and uh, our our gear gear source storage. One of the, one of the things is uh, the stand standard now is that all our turn tur turnout gear is not not is not supposed to be in anywhere near the the, the living space spaces out in in here. So you have a, a very very Strong separation between the, uh, the work work area here and the the living space. So, you want to do the talk? <laughs> Remember, they're preliminary. Yeah, preliminary. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, so again, this based on what we've priced out here and based on um, at the time they actually didn't have a site, so there's no site figures figured in this number either. Um, they just chose generic site cost and they came up with this as a generic price of what we would be talking about right now. There was no discussion about how to arrange anything. It's all arranged one floor. You can arrange it two floors if you wanted to. Um, there was some discussion about how many? How to arrange some of the bays? But this mm -hmm. is still in the preliminary phase. It's based on the analysis of what the department needs to conduct its mission, and then how much space that, that equipment and that those things need inside the building. Yeah, for, uh, as as you said, there were there were some some plots plots that, that they look, look, looked at where it 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 would make make sense to go up. You know, because you you don't don't have 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 enough space. The D the, DP, the w, w site presents the best the best the best spot spot for us, just in term, terms of the the foot footprint of the build, build building. But it also offers offers us an area area for us for us to train. Yeah, there's 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 space space there that we don't don't have now. We have have to go out and use uh, we use uh, Ruxton's to train 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 at times. We can't really train on our own, our own, our own ground, ground, and uh, uh, do do specific things to what 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 uh, what, what our work work in, in, in entails. So, okay. So where are where where we are now? We've as as you you can see, uh, we're in in the design design phase now. Uh, and the, the next, the next, the next, next two steps would take for probably four, 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 14 months if we start, started today. Eight to, eight to four, four, 14 months. And then it's the uh, construction piece. But that's, that's, you know, and so that's, that's the next, our next big step, step for, for, for us, so. We actually did not complete the schematic design phase. We are complete with schematic Okay, design. we're done with that, okay. Yeah. But you can't go on to the next phase unless you know what site you're building on. Is that correct? We've chosen a site. <laughs> Someone just okay. happened to be occupying that site. Right. <laughs> Gee, I wonder who that is. Sorry. Who? <laughs> I got the mic on now. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, we have finished schematic design. Um, we, cannot, we can go on. We have a site that's been recommended that the Public Works Department is the best site. We've been talking about how to shrink the Public Works Department so that we can move these two projects along simultaneously. If they're approved, we could build them at the same time. We would shrink back on our site um, and let the building begin on the fire station while we begin building on our, our facility. Okay. Questions? OK, 
Kathy. I don't know whether you, this would ask for speculation, but you've gotten to this point without actually bidding out the project, correct? I mean, so this is the best guess. Do, so the price we're looking at, would that be likely to be higher, lower, or you don't know? That, that price is what the designer, we went through the designer selection process. If we go, the pre-planning section is where we actually selected our designer. We actually did a designer selection. So the designer we selected, which is Castle and Booz, uh, this is their best estimate if we were to build that project, what the price would be. And that's based on the numbers which we finished in 2018. So those numbers are relatively, relatively, they're not very old. They are actually very fresh. That's the word I'm looking for, fresh numbers. The, there was an entire bidding process with specifications for the designer and the DPW Fire Station um, Advisory Committee did that selection process. You know, I wanted to just re real quick, just talk, you know, one of the, one of the things the town was, and we talked talk about was need. I mean, uh, you can go to our, to our, to our web, web site. We have a series, series of photos, photos that were done of the entire, the entire building. I'd ask, ask anyone to call and stop, stop, stop in and we'll give, give, we'll give, give, we'll give, give you a tour. Uh, the, build, build, the building was put up in 1929. It's been around a, 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 a little, little while. It's a nice built building. It just doesn't work. It just, right. it, it doesn't work. When we did the study in 2006, this was even before your time here, mm -hmm. Chief Nelson. Well, the first, the first one was done before. Oh, it was done. Done long before all yes. of us were, were here. There's 19, been 1947 was right. the fir first right. study. But even as recently as 2006, uh, the recommendation basically was for Central Fire Station. It was cheaper to demolish it and build a new substation or station there than it was to try to renovate it. If you read the 1947 study, you read the 2003 study, you read the 2006 study. In fact, even the staffing study that was done a couple, a couple of years ago, you can take the head, head, headers off and they all read the same. <laughs> they that that the build, build building is too small to fit the needs of of, of, of the fire, fire, fire department and it just it doesn't work. Right. Any other questions at this time? Yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah. So well, I was just curious about zoning because I didn't see um, zoning as one of the, the columns. I see neighborhood impact, but I assume that either be site plan review or a special permit. Yes, there, there is some permitting that has to go into it, but the one thing about the, our, uh, the DPW site is is that it's already a municipal site, so it's actually already owned by the town. It falls a bit under the, those rules, which are a little different, so they didn't actually try to compare apples to apples in there. They just noted, if you read the report, it says they noted that you do have permitting process you have to go through. Okay. Yes, Evan. I have a comment from Mandy Joe. Okay. Okay. Um, I appreciate the cost estimates, and but I want to get back to I think what Kathy was saying. When I do a square foot cost on this estimate that I know is really preliminary, it seems really high, somewhere in the six hundred to eight hundred and forty dollar range, depending on which square footage you decide. So I'm curious. Is that a normal square foot cost for a fire station? Is that high? Is that low? Do you know where the designers got that? Um, and how do we gauge that? So if you actually, the number is actually on the right side of the, in the comment section, 596, 60 is their square footage cost. When you start talking about this building, it is higher than a normal building if you're just building an office building because of the actual things you have to build into it to make it into the fire station. The chief talked a little bit about separating the gear, the turnout gear from the living spaces. There's actually three buildings here and there's actually an airlock between the two, two sections. When you leave the fire apparatus bay and you walk into the Actually, it's easier if I show the yeah. picture. Yeah. 
So you leave the fire apparatus bay and then you walk into this section here, you are in a self-contained airlock system. All the air in that system goes through purifiers and is sucked out and controlled in that one section. It's so it's negative pressure. Yes, neg ne negative pressure, which pulls it in, makes sure everything comes into it, and all the any of the vapors, any of the chemicals the firefighters were exposed to that's off-gassing from their suits, which is off-gassing from them, is collected and then processed out. So that's actually a cost that's a little above and beyond a normal building. This would be like building one of the labs at UMass where you're trying to make sure that you have um, positive pressure in there and you're controlling the chemicals they're working in. Um, one of the things that they point out a lot, and I always wondered about myself, but firefighters have a they have a history of having a lot of nasty diseases. And it comes from going to a fire, you come back from the fire, you take your gear off, you throw it at the bottom of your rack and you take a nap, and your gear is sitting there off-gassing all this stuff, and you're sitting there sleeping, or laying there sleeping, and taking it all in. So that's why there's this one special section, and that actually is probably the biggest cost increaser in this building, is having that section. You have special laundry, you have special storage areas, and you have a special decontamination area, kind of all all together in this area. And that's and that's and that is a national stance stance standard, really. And it's actually uh, mm -hmm. prom, prom, promulgated by the end of the NFPA, right right down down right right down down the road. The third piece is the admin says says section here. So as Guilford said, three says separate build, build buildings, three separate fun functions. Hence, I believe that that's that's where that you know that in the increase in co cost yeah. comes, but you really can't escape escape that if if you know as 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 he said, this is not an office build, 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 right. building and it's used 24/7, 365. So, isn't there also a special decontamination coming off of ambulances? Yes, yes, and okay. when you know what actually, you know, I'm glad we're glad we're glad we're glad you brought 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 that up. Because because we, we, we do e the EMS as well, we have a separate area area, area, area where where we'll take 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 care of those 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 type of bio 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 right. ha 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 hazards and that that type type of thing, uh, dispose 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 you know that you have you have to keep all all our uh, drugs and equi equi equipment separate and not exposed to. Uh, in, in any type type of contaminants, so you've 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 got almost three and a half bill 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 billings put in one, and again, it's you know it's not this is not a strip strip mall, it's it's a fire 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 fire, fire station and it's highly spe specialized, that's just and that's just the world we live we live in now. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Pat. Um, since the 1947 study is almost as old as I am, um, I want to thank no. you. I want to thank you and the current firefighters and fighters before you for keeping us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's move on to. You're up to. I guess we have one other presentation on fire. This is the tour. No, no. We're this going on to DPW. Yeah, uh, the uh, like, well, uh, the tour, the tour of the station. That's six, 65 slides. That's a lot of, and and it's all Thank on you. on it. It's on it's on our web, web website, or stop in and visit. We are also going to arrange an actual visit to various facilities when the weather is better and we aren't expecting snow. So, moving on. <laughs> yeah, right. So the next talk we're going to, uh, presentation we're going to have is on the DPW. DPW proposal was finished in 2016. So we're already three years old in this. So it's, uh, some of the numbers, there is some dated material here as far as the numbers go. Uh, brief history, we're kind of like the Bang Center. We're one of the t few town buildings that functions now not in the capacity it was built for. The Bang Center was built as a school and then converted. We were built as a trolley barn and converted. Uh, 
Uh, I, I left out the slide that was inside the trolley barn. I apologize for that, but that's actually in the counselor's packet when you see the pictures of inside the building. The, the four gentlemen who are working on trolley motors, that was, that's what we, this building was used for for quite a while before we took it over. Um, just that's the history of what we've been doing. So we did the same thing. We took what we do, vehicle maintenance, traffic lights, electrical, administration, highway, parks and rec, water, the parts of the sewer which are in the main building. And we went through and we kind of listed them all out and then listed out our equipment, listed out our people, and listed out what we needed to do for each and the spaces we needed for each of those functions. And we came up with schematic drawings like this and a table as well. We came up with some preliminary layouts, how we would lay stuff out in a, in a barn. And then we came up with some needs. These are the square foot needs. The original needs are on the, in the middle, reduced are on the right. Uh, we said, well, that's a lot of space. Can we reduce it? Um, that's what happened. We reduced down 5,000, I think it's, uh, no, we reduced down just a little bit. Four, 6,000 square feet is what we reduced down to. So, and then that's basically how we were, we set ourselves up. Um, administration, staff support. Staff support is like the fire department, except it's not as complicated as the fire department, but it is lockers for your gear. So you come to work, you can change clothes and put on your work clothes. At the end of work, you can take your clothes off, shower, and go home clean. Um, <laughs> one of the funniest things is when I did a sewer call in Northampton, I came home and, uh, it was really late at night. I came home. My wife met me at the door and said, you're going in the garage. <laughs> and I actually, she said, your bathrobe's in the garage and there's a towel in the garage. Change your clothes off and come inside and shower. <laughs> um, that, we had that same problem. Uh, we do have chemicals. We are exposed to um, biohazards when we do some work. Um, so we do need to clean up. But it's not, as, it's not to the detail that the fire department has. So there's showers, there's cleaning areas, and so forth. So that's the staff support. Highway, the big trucks, tree and grounds. We want to move the, our proposal is to move the barn at the high school to the new facility and consolidate. We want to do that for two reasons. One's management reason, just to have everybody together and to have consolidation and the same services for the staff and to be able to communicate better. The second one is, is that we want to redevelop community field. And here we have this little industrial site sitting in the middle of community field. It wasn't supposed to get that big. We weren't supposed to have that much equipment there, but it has gotten bigger and bigger as time has gone on, and it detracts from, if you're going there for recreation or going there to the high school, it's like, whose who's construction company is that over there? So we want to move that out, and we brought that to the main building. The water department, their administrative offices function out of our office. Uh, that's the distribution crew, and that's the meter crew, and, and a couple other crews that work in the water, they work out of there. Uh, maintenance, we do all the vehicle maintenance for our building, for our vehicles. We also do some inspections for the entire town. We do all vehicle inspections for the entire town. And then we do, we talked about when we do this building, maybe consolidating and bringing in some of the scattered maintenance that's around town. The schools do some maintenance, the police do some maintenance the fire, do some maintenance. We thought of bringing that stuff in and consolidating it. We don't have really room for that now because our bays are, maintenance bays are too small. And if you look at the pictures in the big presentation, you'll see they're much too small. And then we just need to store our equipment. Storing the equipment takes up the biggest space. Storing our equipment is also the place where we can, where we can actually stage how we build this building. We kind of need the stuff at the top we need some of the vehicle storage immediately, and then we can stage and add on as we need to and as funds become available for the additional vehicle storage. We have some vehicles that have to be inside or else they freeze and they're not useful. The Vactor, the big truck with the elephant snout on the front, the kindergartners from the common school call it the elephant trunk, <laughs> truck, elephant truck. Uh, that has to be inside because there's water inside of it. Uh, there's a couple other vehicles that have things like that inside that can't freeze, they have to be inside. So you can, this is one of the few buildings, actually it's the only building, where you can talk about staging how you do it. When we started this process, we had nine sites. Actually, there was a tenth one. It went really fast and was taken off the table. Um, 
we did all, analyzed all these sites and came up with a chart, rated them all. The um, top three I took that slide out, sorry. Top three when we did the study, Fort River, which we've been, been, been taken off the table. The town wants to do something else there if they don't do a school there. School is number one. Something else besides DPW is number two. Something else besides something else is number three. About number one million down the list is DPW site. So we'll, Fort River is never going to be a DPW site. So people keep saying that. We're never going to go there. It's just not going to happen. Uh, second site was uh, off of Old Farm Road, which is number four on the list. Uh, that's now conservation land. Uh, the third site is for sale still, but I believe there's a purchase and sale agreement going on. And that's number seven, Ball Lane. Those were the top three sites. Uh, we're still looking for a site. We have a couple more which weren't in the original study. Um, we looked at all, when we did a site evaluations, we looked at all these items. We looked at, one of the biggest things we looked at was permitting and effects on our neighbors. So that was a big piece in that one. We, we are a 24-hour operation. We're not, unlike the fire department who gets a call and leaves, if we come into work, a snowstorm, someone's there all the time during the snowstorm and we make a lot of noise. And it's a bit of a disturbance at times. This is just a rough, if you take all the blocks and you just block them in, a very rough schematic of what the layout might look like for the building. Um, that's how we came up with the site size, the minimum site size we need. And then the thing to remember is, is that the big piece in the middle is the one that can be kind of staged. And then for prices, we came up with a, actually I might take the big price off. 375 square, 375 square feet, of $375 a square foot is what we came up with. And then these at the time were sites we compared ourselves to. These were DPWs that Weston and Sampson was, were working on at the time. Um, Bourne and Norwood were very similar to those. Medford was a little different. They don't do as much water work, I think, as we do. And where we are in the process right now, we finished up in March of 2018, which actually we finished up more in 2016. I should have changed that to 16. Uh, we're waiting to go to the next phase. Um, we just need to move forward with that. We are looking at a couple of sites, and the site, for us, our site has not really been determined yet. So we are kind of still waiting for that. And we're still working on that piece. And that's it for this one, if you have any questions. Questions, yes. Pat. The the big price? You said you left it off? Yeah, but I'm I don't curious. know why I left that off. <laughs> <laughs> Approximate. It's approximately uh, 35 million, yeah. if you want. Okay. <laughs> this is my million day. I will talk in millions, not. Uh... Additional questions? Yes, Shalini. I'm just curious if the DPW building could be on the same site as the fire station? We could, if the site is big enough. We can't be on the existing site we're proposing for the fire station because of the river behind us. The Fort River is behind us, and there's this 200-foot ma magical line which is there to protect the resource area of the river. Um, if we take that 200-foot line on the DPW site, the DPW already encroaches onto that line. You can't add anything beyond towards the river. So the site is almost exclusively filled with the fire station, and we don't fit unless you could figure out more land in that area. You need about, what, eight acres for this? We, we need eight. For, for DPW. Eight, eight is what is in the study. If you read the study, it says eight. And then if you really want to have nice, nice buffers, you might want to go with 10 acres. 
And fire requires how many acres? About three? It's, if you take out the training part, yeah. I think it was uh, one and a half, and then the rest is three, I believe, yes. Okay. Kathy? It, it's in the study. So. Yeah. I'm looking at the cost chart that was in our pack. Um, what is that number? And there's, you know, you said around 35, but you have a line called soft costs that adds, you know, so we've got the three different sites and unconsolidated, so there's a bottom line that's quite a bit higher than 35 if you do soft costs. So I have a question of, of soft costs. And my second, in looking at the pictures, um, the place where the vehicles would be inside, is that, are those, could those be simple, I'm going to use the wrong terms, um, but simple metal with a cement floor that just keeps them out of the elements? And would that be less expensive than the visual of the other place that looked quite elegant, like it was an indoor building with beautiful bays of the pl some existing world? But think of the great picnic you'd have in that big one. We showed you the picnic we have in the other building. It's kind of tired. If we had it, no. Uh, so the answer to that question, soft cost are things, are, are furnishings, furniture, uh, those type of things that go inside the building. Do you put carpet in? Do you put tile in? Those are things that really haven't been decided. So those are things that are also possible that you could put in basics and then upgrade as you go along. Um, we could take our old furniture we have now and use that furniture. We, we are like the ultimate take it or leave furniture group. Um, the guys, it's not gonna be appreciated with the DPW. It'd be nice if we move into a new building and have new, but there are things that could be, we could adjust the cost and we could work on to make them more compatible. The, just like in the fire department, you have three sections of the fire department. In the DPW, you really, you really need three sections. <coughs> We need an office section and a staff section, which is climatized so that it's comfortable to work in. Work in, take a shower in, do those type of things. Not all at the same time, but in your right place. You need a section to keep vehicles above freezing. So the vehicles I talked about that can't freeze, the sewer vac, a couple other trucks that can't freeze, you need a section of vehicle storage which we keep above freezing. So that's above 50, or around 50, not above 50, around 50. Mm -hmm. And then you just need a place for covered storage. So yes, you can start out with covered storage which has no heat in it. It's just out of the, it's out of the wind, it's out of the snow, it's out of the rain. And then work from there later on to add heating to it or add what you want to, to it. So that yes, that's how we talk about staging. That's where you get the staging. One of the other things that came up during these various studies and that is you reduce the life of a vehicle when it's left outside by at least three years if you're lucky <laughs> other questions on this I'm going to actually suggest we take a break before we do the street scan five minutes and then we're going to actually look at the horizontal issues of the town right yeah So as we were looking at the capital projects, there are many people who have suggested that our infrastructure is like a fifth project. And so we asked Mr. Bachman to have Guilford, Mr. Mooring, to come back and talk about our streets and, in, and our infrastructure, sidewalks. So the council has seen this slide before. It's a little different, but not that much different. So street scan is what we use to prioritize and scan and manage the roads in town. Um, it has a vehicle which drives. OK, yeah, I kind of cut this a little shorter. So it has a vehicle that drives around. There's LIDAR, there's scanners. There's actually uh, the little motion detectors which you have in your cell phones, which uh, can tell vibrations. Um, so you can tell how bumpy the road is, all this stuff comes up with a lot of numbers and tells you the condition of our roads. Again, we showed this last time, this is the, this is the breakdown of our road conditions. Um, we're trying to, to uh, we want to be at 70, a PCI of 70 or higher. 100 is great, just like in school. Zero are no cookies, as we called it in school, no cookies. 
you have to take the class over again. It's not what we want, not what we want, want to be at. So um, we're average at about 63, and this was, and the scan was done two years ago now. So um, we've actually had a lot of deterioration since then. Um, but this is the kind of the breakdown of our roads. As we talk about roads, the thing to remember is, is a, a road is a lot like a, a living being because it's affected by the elements as much as we as people are affected by the elements. So when the weather's rough, the road's at worse speeding. If it gets really, really cold and stays cold all winter, that's far better for the road than heating and cooling and heating and cooling, just like us. We don't like it when it gets really too hot and then get really too cold. We like it to stay one temperature, usually about 70, and everything is good, right? So the, the roads are the same way. Um, <clears throat> this is a, base, a breakdown of our segments of roads and how they fall into the categories. Um, again, to the far right is 85 to 100, which is like excellent, very good roads. 70 to 85 is good roads, and then you start deteriorating as you come down. So we actually have four segments when we did this scan, which were zeros, or less than zero. Our weighted, our weighted survey of the whole town it was 63 when we did this two years ago. 28% um, of our roads have structural damage. <clears throat> we estimated that we needed $16 million just to repave the roads. And then if we put in contingency and police cost and some other costs that we use, uh, there's another, you just add another $10 million to cover those costs. Um, so that's kind of our backlog for roads. And if we actually were to budget, this was based on two years ago, if we actually were to budget these numbers here, we'd be able to bring our PCI, the PCI is on the left side, we'd be able to bring our PCI up to 70 if we used $2.5 million a year to pave our roads after four years. Now we're a little behind this now because this is two years ago, and yes, we've had some deterioration, a lot of deterioration. We've had a lot of freezing and thawing, and we're not helping our winter maintenance and our winter, our winter techniques for keeping the cars moving in the winter are not helping our roads. By having a lot of salt on the roads, keeping the water flowing, keeping water moving around and not just freezing and staying frozen, we're actually helping to accelerate, I think, that freeze-thaw cycle, which uh, <clears throat> we've been noticing over the last few years since we've been using all salt. So we're not really helping with the weather, our weather conditions. So we're a little behind. This is just a... If things had stayed perfect, this is just where we are. So we're at $27 million is when we first did the study. We're probably a little more right now. I don't know the exact number. And then as we move along, hopefully we'll catch up. But that's the fifth, fifth project. Is, that's okay. the fifth project as we were talking about the infrastructure for the roads. And um, that's kind of what it is. We actually do, uh, so we have $800,000 to get from Cap, um, chapter 90. Chapter 90 is 800 and some thousand dollars a year. The town has been putting an extra amount of money in. We put in a, almost a million dollars. We put 953,000 last year to help us with this. And then we do a lot of road and uh, water and sewer projects in the roads. And when the water and sewer department cuts the road to make a repair, the water and sewer department pays to fix the road. So Amherst Woods is being resurfaced now, and most of that's coming from sewer funds because we were doing sewer work in that whole section and tearing the, ro the roads up for sewer work. Um, we're gonna go, we have a couple more roads we're doing water work on next year and they'll get resurfaced for, with water money. So uh, it's not really fair to make the road people pay for when we're doing the water and sewer work. So we, sometimes we spend around $3 million, but it's not a consistent $3 million. And sometimes the three million dollars is not in the right spot. If we're doing a road or sewer project that's in a road that's in decent condition, we may end up cutting that road a lot more, a lot sooner than we want to, just to deal with a water and sewer issue. So that's kind of how we handle it. Um, the last last slide I want to show you on this is actually separate. Yes, Paul. Oh, well, well, Guilford was looking for that. Um, 
I do want to emphasize that last year, and you'll see this again this year, the town has moved off a lot of the capital requests from departments so that we carve out as much money as possible for road repairs. Typically, historically, the town has done about $300,000 in Guilford Mention. We're nearly, we're, we almost got to a million dollars uh, this year uh, for road repairs, and we're moving in that same direction for the budget you will receive on May 1st. So we're trying to get there. Um, it just means there's just a lot of balancing act, and we'll be reviewing this with JCPC. Okay. Thank you. Guilford. So I was asked if there's a list. That's the famous where everybody calls up and says, my street has a pothole, can you fix it? And we say, yes, it's on the list. Um, well, there actually is a list for big road projects. This is our, sh <laughs> this is our list we kind of keep running for big projects. Um, so at the top was the annual, annual paving for last year, which we haven't fi finished. We'll finish it up in the spring. Uh, West Bay Road sidewalks, that's a project, a large project that's going on in the spring. It got moved off. We have to put together our 2019 paving list for this year, which we don't really have a final number on what we're spending, so we haven't put together the final list of roads we're doing. Uh, East Halley Road multi-use path is being funded by community development block grant money, CDBG. That's the sidewalk, the big sidewalk we're doing on East Halley Road. Mill Street Bridge, that's a state project. The blue ones are funded by the state DOT. That project is going on. Northampton Road resurfacing is, under, is underway in the planning phases. It's scheduled for about 2021 in the state list, and they're going to actually pay for that. Northampton Road, Route 9, from University Drive all the way up to South Pleasant Street. There's some widening going on. There's some sidewalks going on. There's some shoulder work going on. <clears throat> Northampton Road resurfacing, we're working on that project. Oh, wait, wait. Belchtown Road resurfacing, we're working on that project as a TIP project. We proposed that to the state, and the state's approved it, and it's going through the planning and design process. That's from Southeast Street all the way to Belchertown. Road widening, sidewalks, some shoulder work. The state hopefully will pay for that as well. These are just rough budgetary numbers in those three. Um, North Pleasant Street and Pine Street intersection and the Sunderland Road, Montague Road intersection. Those are the two that are in yellow here. Um, they had been broken apart. Now we're kind of mushing them back together to do the, to do the analysis of the intersection concepts we have. So that's going on right now, and we're supposed to have a report from them by the end of the month on what the best concepts and how the intersections work together. And then once that's done, we can start moving that project forward and trying to do, decide what we want to do next in that project. But that's the North Amherst intersection mushed together, both pieces. Station Road Bridge is in there. The one in red, which you can't read very well, is a parking lot. That's the Main Street parking lot in front of Town Hall, which is on hold. I understand. We did a lot of preliminary work on that, so it's on our list. The North Pleasant Street parking lot, which is the lot previously known as CVS parking lot, which we call North Pleasant Street parking lot now. Um, the two property owners there were talking about resurfacing the lot, and we would thought we would help do our piece as well and resurface the entire lot. That's kind of being a concept being floated around. That's as far as that's gone, it's just a concept. Uh, North Pleasant Street, the PET upgrades on North Pleasant Street is a project from the roundabout at Eastman Lane going all the way to Pine Street. And that's to upgrade the sidewalks, maybe change the sidewalks from two five-foot sidewalks to one six, eight, ten-foot sidewalk, and then maybe one five-foot sidewalk on the other side. The uh, West Street and Pomeroy intersection was a project which was put together many years ago and is kind of sitting on the shelf, it's already put together, it just needs to be dusted off, and we can change the intersection at Pomeroy and West Street. East Pleasant Street upgrades, I should say pedestrian upgrades, sorry about that. Um, that's for doing sidewalks on East Pleasant Street from where they end now to Pine Street again, and we need to uh, do the survey before we can start the work on that. North Pleasant Street through UMass, that's a, con a project the U university wants to do with the town, and we were gonna kind of change, change a little bit how that's set up. So we have basically, well, it's gonna have some type of bike lane, 
travel lane and, a, and the UMass big sidewalks will be UMass big sidewalks. Um, there's a water line that runs through there we're going to work on as well. Uh, Route 9 and University Drive intersection, that's a state project. The state's been working on this. Uh, as I said once before in a meeting, there's three intersections that came up on the really bad intersection list from the state several years ago. This is the third one. There was Pine in North Pleasant, and there was Meadow and 116. This is the third one, 9 and University Drive. The state's working on that. Uh, South Amherst Common, that's come back up as something people want us to look at. Let's make some changes to the South Amherst Common and do some design improvements there. And then Mill Lane, we've been requested to look at Mill Lane because Groff Park is in there and we're making changes to Groff Park and how to connect Groff Park back to West Street and then to the new sidewalks we're doing on East Hadley Road. That was kind of, that's what that project is. It might grow. People would like us to pave Mill Lane and that whole project may grow a little bit. So as, as street stuff goes, <coughs> none of these are included in the 27 and $16 million number. But if we did these, some of that number would get smaller. But it's not included in that bigger number. When we do things with the state, doing things with the state costs us more. It costs $50,000, or actually $45,000 for me to have a surveyor come in and survey North Pleasant Street from Pine Street back to the campus. It's gonna cost me $160,000 to survey from uh, Southeast Street to the town line for the project on uh, Belchtown Road project. It's about twice the length of the survey, but it's not twice the cost. So doing things for the state, because you wanna get free state money, there ain't no such thing from the state as free. You're paying, and you're gonna probably pay more than you would normally pay to get that free state money. Just, it's one of my concepts in life. Just remember that, there's no free money. Uh, so that's overall road projects. So I guess I'm ready for questions. Okay, questions. Yes, Shalini. Um, I was curious about the criteria used, and I've been talking about that for a while. Like, how do you prioritize? How do we prioritize which projects get done first? So that's a good question because <laughs> this is just the leftover list from before we had the TAC and before the TAC got started talking about it. The two projects the TAC started talking about and started to prioritize and started to add on to this list. If you look at the far right corner, there's something that says TAC priority for 2019. They th chose the North Pleasant Street pet upgrades and they chose the East Pleasant Street pet upgrades as their number one priority that they'd like to see money allocated towards. So what, how these projects start is, is there's usually a request and in the past it was usually from the town manager's office and from us talking that this road really needs something done to it and that put it on the list. Um, or the state came forward with the project and that got it on the list and that's how it went forward. Now we're gonna see that, that the TAC will have more of an input of taking the requests they get from residents and flushing out something and saying we should spend some money on this and we're gonna put it on our list as a recommendation that goes into the capital plan and then the capital plan goes through its process and we see if money comes out. Is that? Additional questions? Yes, Lisa. Thank you for the hundreds of pages of slides that we had uploaded, but we don't have this one, unfortunately. And so when we do get that one, I wonder if you could flesh it out. I realize that requires additional time. But with the words you just gave us in terms of point A to point B, because I'm sorry, but I don't think we're all going to remember which section of each road that would be. So I wonder if you have either a longer version of this you could send to us that has another field that says from here to here and from here to here, because this is really useful to be able to refer to. No, I, I'll add that on. It's all, it's all kind of burned into our brains, so we just know. Sorry. Yes, Kathy. Um, I also, I can't see this, so I'm glad that Alyssa said it, sent it to us, but you, I think you said that what you have up here is not part of the road backlog that we've got. And so the dollar m sound numbers you were showing on the 800,000 plus another, so one and a half million a year-ish, that doesn't include these costs or does that 
budget that the town's been allocating, does it include sidewalks or intersection fixes? Anything that's an improvement beyond just repaving the road, it's not included in that 16 or $27 million number. I t I'll just call it $27 million number of road repairs. Any, any sidewalk improvement, any intersection improvement, that's not included in that number. So you won't be able to take these numbers to the right if you add those numbers up as cost estimates. They're, they're a lot more than they don't match up. So these numbers aren't included in that at all. And then they're, they're also not coming out or if they're not budgeted in the, you know, the budget projections you showed us, that doesn't have these in them either. Those aren't in those either at all. That's why there's two separate things. So these are the bigger projects which have more improvements. This is, uh, this is like paving a road, repairing a road on steroids. You're usually getting new sidewalks. You're usually getting some type of changes to the intersections. You're usually getting some type of enhancement beyond just paving the road. The other list is just paving the road. Yes, Dorothy. I realize that adding these are, is very expensive, but I applaud you doing it because I think that it will affect the lives of an awful lot of people in the town and the whole quality of life. So I hope we can figure out some way to include it without going broke. Other comments or questions at this time? Shalini? Just a clarification, when you say roads, does it include bike paths as well? What includes bike paths? The, the, these 16 million, because I understand sidewalks is not included, but Side bike paths, which are part of the road, is that included? If you're talking about the uh, bike, pa uh, bike accommodation on the roadway, it's included in the bike accommodation if it exists already. So like East Pleasant Street is wide enough to have bike lanes on it now, so that's included in the $16, $27 million. Um, but Pine Street, or not Pine Street, Henry Street does not have bike lanes on it. So bike lanes on Henry Street are not included in that 16 to $27 million. Additional questions? I'd like to open it for public comment and ask it for a show of hands of those people who would like to comment. Three. Okay, uh, we are going to limit you to three minutes. Please come up and uh, state your name and the area that you'd like to comment on. And let's start over here. No, you have to press the button in the center, yes. Where it says push. <laughs> um, I'm Alex Lefebvre. I'm a trustee with the Jones Library, so I'll be speaking on behalf of the library project. Um, I don't have any prepared comments, but I heard some really good questions from the council, so I just wanted to take a second to give you my thoughts. Um, one of the questions was about could we reorganize the existing space that we have, and I think that's an excellent cost-effective question. So I think it's important that people know that the MBLC does, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, does provide a resource to the library, which the library did take advantage of prior to applying for the grant, to bring somebody in to look at our existing space to see if we could reorganize it to take better advantage of the space for our community needs. And the conclusion that the MBLC came to was that we could not, in fact, use our existing space. Um, so the second question that was asked was, can we, can we do with our existing library? If we make the changes that the library director talked about in phase one and perhaps phase two, and we pay for it through JCPC process, can we live with that as a community? And you know, I think the answer to that is a difficult one because libraries serve the function of being the great equalizer, right? They are the social justice tool of a town. And unfortunately, our existing library, without the expansion, the people in our community who are being left behind are our populations that are most in need. So for example, right now, children's programming, which is our most popular programming, we turn families 
away from our programming because we don't have enough space to accommodate all of the people who are interested in that programming. Our English uh, as a second language programs are some of our most popular programs. We have a long waiting list. If anyone wants to be a tutor, I'm gonna put a plug in because we always need more people. But those programs, what winds up happening is the ESL programs wind up taking the public meeting spaces because we don't have enough space to accommodate people in the library. So our meeting spaces, which are taken advantage of almost every single day, wind up not being available to uh, as many people who might want to take advantage of public meeting spaces, which I think are important to have access to free meeting spaces in a library, and we lose that. Um, our teen spaces, um, you know, you have two issues. One, we want to bring teens into the library, we want to teach them about libraries, and we don't have a space that does that right now. Putting them in a basement, they may think it's cool, but I don't think it's a good way to teach them to be a good citizen. But more importantly, our teen collection is very, very small. Youth uh, adult books have doubled in terms of sales in the last 10 years. The largest group, 70% of people who purchase are 18 to 64 year old. So they're not even teens, and we don't have the space to accommodate that kind of growth. So we, we have somebody to direct the programs, but not to accommodate the growth. So I could, I'm sure you're, uh, computers, I, I could go on, right? We don't, if you go into the library on any certain day, you will see a large number of low income, homeless, home insecure, people who their only access to the internet, their only access to computers is at the library. We offer programs for college education, for continuing education, for music, for art. There are unlimited resources available to people for free at the library and we don't have enough computer terminals to meet those needs. So what becomes a difficult question is, do we as a community feel the library is our social justice support for our community? And if the answer is yes, then I would say our existing building doesn't meet that. Thanks. Thank you. There was another comment back there. Actually, okay. Yes, ma'am. You have to push the button and the green light goes on. Yeah, it's, oh, okay, it is working, all right. I'm Nancy Baer, I'm a member of the uh, District One uh, Neighborhood Association in North Amherst. Uh, in, in the interest of bringing the, this is just a little over one minute. In the interest of bringing the concerns of North Amherst District One uh, residents to the council, I make these points which are taken from a letter to town councilors from Meg Gage. Many of us feel North Amherst infrastructure issues are overdue for attention. We cannot walk over the Mill River Bridge after five years of the bridge being out. Our library does not have a restroom and is not accessible to people with disabilities. The traffic light at the Meadow and Pine Street and Route 63 Montague Road intersection is an ancient signal which keeps traffic backed up for 15 to 20 minutes every day at rush hour. Many families on East Pleasant Street walk on this well-traveled road without sidewalks. Two excellent steps in addressing these challenges would be a smart traffic light allowing left turns at the Meadow Pine Street Route 63 Montague Road intersection, a $50,000 for a sidewalk survey of East Pleasant Street the first step in building sidewalks. And I was encouraged to hear that uh, these two items are on the list. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. There was another comment back here, sir. Hello, Chris Hockman. I'm having trouble understanding the distribution on here. I was looking at the numbers 19 and 21 and concluded that that's 40%, but the graphic shows me far in excess of 50% of that area shown. So I'm somewhat, I'm led to believe that that large area, the majority of the sh chart shows me that roads are 85 or better for the pavement condition index. But the, I, that I believe is somewhat misleading. Uh, and if we go down to the next part, 
the breakdown of by mileage and number segments, uh, we'll see that in actuality, those two categories that are graphically depicted up there looking like 50% or more are really 6.15 miles, which are 10, uh, 11.1 miles of a 101 miles of roads, which is 10%. That's not 50 something percent like the slide led me to believe, but I, if I go back to the slide, I'm wondering if perhaps the, those are just segments of the sampling that were done and so that actually the segments vary in size on the street scan. They can be 150 feet, they can be 2,000 feet, the segments. So maybe the number of actual samplings really would lead to that conclusion. But I think that's a, that graphic is not a good one to uh, assess and say, oh, lots of green, we're great, uh, when in fact it's only 10% of them are in that, that color category, really, if you go by miles. And that's what us drivers are concerned about, miles, not segments of st uh, statistical samples. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Other qu comments from in here? Yes. So, yeah, that's on. Um, my name is Julian Hines, and I wanted to first say thank you to um, Mr. Nelson and for all his work and his department's work in town for keeping us safe. And I'd next like to thank Mr. Morin um, for the work that he's probably going to have to do tomorrow. <laughs> um, and then my second comment is that I would like to um, make sure that we have some way of preserving the fire station downtown that I understand it it is sort of falling out of its time of usability, yet at the same time, I think that it's an important historic figure in our town and is a very pretty architectural building and is visually appealing. So whether we build a fire station in South Amherst or not, I think it's important to preserve that area and not have demolition there. I'd be very disappointed if we demolished it or made large changes to the front of it, but I have heard the ideas of an art studio, which I thought was pretty interesting. It could also be turned into things like a coffee shop or, um, like I know Belchertown has a historic fire museum, which I think might be a cool thing there. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, then with the council's agreement, we're gonna move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a discussion item. It's regarding a proposed fourth standing committee of the council, and it is labeled at this time the Community and Economic Development Committee. Um, we are not taking a motion at this time, although there could be a decision to do a motion, uh, but I am actually going to call on uh, both Steve and Dorothy to um, head this discussion. Well, we are very uh, pleased to introduce the new proposed Town Council Standing Committee of uh, Community and Economic Development. and. I noticed that in the uh, material in preference to the charter, not in the charter, but the description beforehand, it discussed some things which were not clarified in the charter. And it mentioned that the election of council members would promote democracy by representing what the voters want, providing the central focus now lacking on what we want the town to look like. And the hope was that we would now have a public and comprehensive conversation about issues regarding zoning and the master plan, and to quote the text, instead of important planning and zoning decisions being made piecemeal and out of sight. So economic development and vitality are goals that we all share, but economic development is closely related to the attractiveness of the town and its quality of life. 
We want to grow, yet to keep the unique qualities of Amherst as a New England college town and to be a town that reflects its intellectual, progressive nature, as well as, a, as his historical and cultural roots. So the description of the committee, um, okay, I will read the committee. Um, I have to hold this button down every, every moment. Uh, to advise the council on matters which impact sustainable planning, land use, zoning, agriculture, open space and recreation, infrastructure, housing, design review, transportation, neighborhood stabilization or revitalization, historic preservation, art and culture, and economic development in order to build on Amherst's special character and to improve the quality of life. In furtherance of these objectives, the committee shall analyze, research, and review recommendations for changes in the zoning bylaw and other land use laws and collaborate with the planning board on master plan updates. The committee shall also consider relevant issues and conduct research on the relationship between the town and the educational institutions and other partners within the town to develop policies and programs that will enhance economic development. So that was well said. So we, uh, this issue's been discussed at full council meetings, but then also at our retreat. So we had a great discussion at the retreat and Dorothy and I did our best to um, weigh through or go through what was sometimes conflicting opinions of the counselors and come up with a document that we think, that we hope that the full council can take action on at our next meeting. Are there comments or questions? Andy? So I guess that I, my question is in the very first line and um, what sustainable planning is, what the de how, how that's defined. But before answering it, I want to also just point out that those of us who are thinking about financial um, structure of the town and the financial health of the town, uh, I think that uh, my, my view of sustainable is something that is financial, it creates a town that is in itself financially sustainable, which means that we have to make sure that we're looking at planning as something that's stimulating tax growth, and um, that's why I was curious as to what sustainable planning was and how it relates to uh, the continued development of taxable property that can give us some relief uh, without um, burdening current taxpayers. Shalini. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Andy said in terms of sustainability. I am curious to hear the definition of that. But uh, the way I think of sustainability would be to include um, equity, environment, and economy. They kind of work together for us to have a sustainable community that can be enjoyed by all residents. So it has to include the equity piece. It has to include the environment and you know, the economy that Andy pointed out. Kathy? I'll, I'll stay on this same point. Um, mm -hmm. I think each of us are interpreting this in our own ways, but um, I've been really struck by planning to date in Amherst, and this is not dissimilar as what I see in New York City, that you can't assume just if you expand and get new taxable property that you get a net positive impact on the town budget because we may incur high public costs for that private development. So what I've seen some places do, and I recently looked at Dartmouth's Hanover for an example, they make any new development do a public impact statement. Is it going to need a new road? Is it going to need a sidewalk? Is it going to have to re, so up in North Amherst, will we have to reprogram everything because we're already too crowded? And that that developer has to pay a substantial share of that so it doesn't be public investment and private. So, you know, you're looking at New York and it never gets ahead of the grant game by putting a new piece of real estate in because it's done tax breaks, it hasn't done the extra things, and 
We don't do that kind of accounting that says we get something here, but we paid something there. So if the word can sustainable can be that way of thinking, you know, that it's not just the character and quality of life, but if we're looking for a net yield, you better think in advance rather than after the fact. Additional comments? Yes, Steve. So I wasn't sure if these were rhetorical questions or, or but in the interest of, of um, trying to summarize our discussion, we debated whether or not to include the word sustainable because in many ways in a community like Amherst, it seems unnecessary because this committee will only be as good as the, you know, basically the members that are on it and the council that it reports to plus all the other boards. And we assume that sustainability, the triad uh, that you've mentioned, is pretty much in the DNA of, of um, you know, the community. So I think that we wanted, we did keep it in there as sort of a reminder. And absolutely, there are 13 different definitions of what that is, we all have. But so, um, We've gotten to the first line, but so that was our thing. Yeah. So we, we did, I know there was a, um, someone had, had come up with the idea that sustainability should be in the name of the committee, and we, we debated that between the both of us, and we decided not to in this version, but we're only two out of 13, so if there's some comments on that, we're all, we're all ears. Darcy. <laughs> that was me. Um, yeah, I, I think it would make sense to have it in the title since it is covering all those different areas um, that would be in the master plan and since our current master plan, you know, starts right out with words uh, to the effect that sustainability is our overarching value. So um, I think it would be good to have that there, and I think it would be great to have a separate sentence sort of indicating what Shalini just said about the three, three ways in which we are seeking sustainability in all these different areas. Okay. Um, Evan? Uh, comment from Mandy Joe. Okay, Mandy Joe. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna jump around so that I don't have to do this too often. Um, I am concerned moving down to the third and fourth line, the design review and historic preservation portions, um, how that would intersect with uh, the design review board. And um, I think there's one that does historic preservation to a committee that does that. We've seen it on um, demolition delays and how their regulatory function would intersect with this committee's um, charge to advise on matters related to design review. So that's something I'm unclear about. Um, I'm also unclear about the overarching advise on matters. Is that general matters? Is it things that other committees bring to the council? Is it bylaws? Is specifically bylaws or only bylaws and things like that? Um, the appointing authority, I believe, would need to be the president of the town council, since it would be a co committee of the council. And then just as, as chair of the governance committee, as the governance committee is seeking a uniform for a committee charge, a uniform structure, um, I'd just recommend maybe before any action is done on this, a, a referral to that so that we could put it in that uniform structure. Thanks. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I really like what Kathy said. I'm, um, that's in my mind, that's in this description. But it may be that there needs to be some way of making it clearer. Because what we, we're trying to do in this committee is to connect the dots, to bring the pieces together, to put things in context, not to do things just separately. And new things that come in, new buildings, um, that may, for example, there may be uh, sidewalk problems, there may be a need for new parking. There are things that might come with it that we, we would want the project, but we have to make sure that, that the whole thing is looked at. Okay, additional comments? Yes, Pat. 
Um, a small comment. Um, my colleague Steve said that in the DNA of, of Amherst, we talk, we have equity and we concern for the environment and the economy. And I would say those are aspirational goals, that we have not reached those goals as a community. And we need to look at ourselves quite clearly, because if you can't see it, you can't change it. Good point. OK. Additional comments? Evan. Just a question for the authors uh, about what exactly is meant by uh, neighborhood stabilization or revitalization? So an example would be the pressures on the university area neighborhoods. And I think that that concern comes up mostly in Amherst in terms of, of um, you know, in that particular context. It also comes in the, into the context of some of the apartment complexes. You, those would be, those are a couple of examples that we discussed. Did you have a follow-on question, Evan? Comment? So that's the concerns. So I, could, it, could you just maybe give me an idea of how you envision this committee would would address those concerns and what it means to stabilize a neighborhood? Dorothy. I'll, I'll make a few thoughts. Well, of course, um, that means um, active code enforcement, um, citizen engagement, it means, um, in terms of older existing communities, um, listening to the residents, seeing if there is something that is needed that would make it a, a better place to live. Just not taking neighborhoods for granted, making sure that part of a strong town has strong neighborhoods, and that we would try to do the things that, that are, would bring that about. George. My concern with this remains that economic development is going to get lost in this long list. And I'm wondering what uh, the uh, two authors feel about that, whether uh, one thought was that there might be a subcommittee or some kind of smaller body that would focus on this issue. But when I look at this, I, I become concerned that economic development um, is going to get lost in, a, in the mix. I believe that um, we had a discussion that um, there was talk of creating another um, town, town committee, not a town council committee, but a town committee on economic development, because we looked and we said that really wasn't being covered that well. So there would be strong work and support that would be feeding into this committee, or we could support their work. Alyssa. So while I don't disagree with the things that are written here, and I appreciate the comments others have had, I still don't understand what you're actually going to do when you sit down and meet for the first time. Because I'm feeling like I understand it if a proposal comes here, and so we start talking about things based on public comment, based on meetings that we've had, et cetera, and we say, you know, this isn't really ready for town council to talk about any further, so let's refer it over to this committee. But it sounds instead like, for example, if this once this committee exists, that some of the members of this committee might decide we need more code enforcement and then do what? I, I'm just a little confused about what the process would be like. Steve? Um, so great question. And so I think part of it is the theory Part of the reason for this committee is the theory that anything that's proposed that requires town council action should go to a committee first. So this would be the committee that would, if you think of a typical town meeting, what was heard at town meeting, much of that had to do with some of the issues that are here, like zoning bylaw changes, the public art um, bylaw. I'm not gonna come up with the, the complete list. So one way to look at this would be that this is simply the first, this is the town council's group that screens proposals that come from either other committees or from through citizen petition. Now it's possible once the group sort of gets its grounding 
So I, the answer, really the answer to your question is I have no idea after that. But once the group gets its grounding, there's nothing, I mean, I could see it becoming more of also an activist where it itself generates, like, wouldn't it be great if there was blank? You know, maybe something that doesn't, isn't appropriately coming out of one of the other many committees in Amherst. But I think that our primary, a primary goal of this is to support the committee structure that already exists in Amherst and basically be the first or be a, um, the liaison between those committees and then the full council. Dorothy. Well, one example of, of uh, something that could come before this committee would be um, what the uh, young man mentioned, the uh, talk about making the firehouse, once it is vacated, into a public art structure. And I think it was at least two years ago, I was invited to a very large committee of people that I didn't know. Um, or I heard about it and I went, that's probably more likely, um, that was on that issue. So there are people in the town who've been working on this for a while. When we talk about economic development, uh, we went to a panels at the um, MMA, the Massachusetts um, um, Municipal Association on vibrant downtowns. And one of the common threads that was in all of them was that there was a restoration of historical buildings and there was some public arts uh, activity and they pointed out that the public art might not make any money, but it made money for the things around it, the restaurants and whatever. And it, that's a kind of a fun way of doing economic development. So that was one item. Uh, another item that would be at least looked at and considered by this committee is the one that, that we are working on and it's gonna come back to us, uh, and that's the town green. Um, there's, there's, in other words, there's professional people who, put, who do a tremendous amount of work in this town who are doing things, but at some point uh, we wanted to say, let's look at the whole picture um, and try to put it together. Uh, Pat. Um, I was in favor of this committee when it was first proposed. Um, it had a much smaller definition, and I'm feeling like this is kind of burgeoning everywhere without necessarily um, needing to. I don't think I want to see this committee review every other committee's actions or thoughts, but I am concerned about sustainable planning, land use, zoning, uh, working on the master plan, economic community and economic development, because unless we develop our community, we're going to lose out on the equity hoogee muggy thing, but we're also going to lose economic chances at economic development because the more you support the community, the more you support small business, the more vitality financially it can come. And I, I'm feeling like this is getting scattered. It's a committee I want to work on, uh, but I'm feeling like we need to refine it and know that I'm rambling and I apologize. But I remember in the initial conversation, someone made the comment that this would slow down other committees. And the comment was made that might be a good thing because of the idea that the two of you have of looking at things holistically. Shall I? I'm seeing the role of this committee also in terms of the master plan and kind of setting the priority. Like, uh, reviewing the master plan and so that we're all on board with what are our priorities as a town. And I think once that's established through that, the other strategic vision is established after that. Okay. Dorothy, oh, Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I guess I, I want to res respond to the a sense that is it too large, is it not focused enough? If this is the only extra committee we've got, so it's one of our fourth, it's the only one that could actually be um, actively proposing policies. We're in a legislative arm of the government. So a question to ask is do we need two rather than one? And I'm not gonna give the definition of the other, you know, if it's too broad. But I'm thinking of policies, um, and we had an early discussion on neighborhoods, rental properties, uh, decline of maintenance, would this be a place where we view the way inspections and fees for failure to comply 
what do we do to raise our standards on rental properties or affordable housing, because it's got all of this in it. And in some other towns, they have two. You know, I'm, I'm not saying how I would divide them, one focused one way and one focused another, because we don't have another committee to be thinking about our housing policies, to think about development and culture and economic life. So I think that's why it is as broad as it is. We don't have another place to have this larger policy research task force. Darcy? Uh, I have sort of been thinking of this committee as the master plan committee. And, um, and when it first came up, I, I was, you know, one of the people that said that feel, felt like a barrier. Um, if it is um, looking at issues that are coming up from below, from from the committees um, or the zoning bylaw or whatever, but um, uh, you know, my preference would be to have it be the master plan committee, where we could refer things down to it. It could have a goal, general goal of trying to update our policies in general in all these different areas for the updated master plan. And that would be a huge job. Um, and it would, you know, various issues would come up, policy issues that would come back up to us so that we could decide them for the master plan. Um, the piece I don't really like is um, that to, to have this committee um, position to be making recommendations on like the zoning bylaw because it, it feels it feels like it's taking the power away from the council uh, to be a step in between that and us Steve so I, I think that everyone's made a great point but to, you know to Kathy's point I struggle with every committee that we has that we have that has an and statement in it. Like, should, if we have an and statement, shouldn't that be two different committees? But I um, was also looking at towns that had broken out economic development and kind of planning and zoning. It may be, and I know, <laughs> hold on to your seats, um, but it may be that some of our committees develop subcommittees. In other words, so that there might be that there's a, these are committees of five counselors and that actually three people are really interested in planning and zoning and three people are interested in, you know, economic development or something like that. You know, to, um, to Darcy's point, which I think is also an excellent one, in a way you could call this the master plan committee because pretty much everything that is listed is a master plan issue. So it could either be, it could be the master plan implementation committee. So we evaluate things regarding the master plan, you know, is this consistent with the master plan? Make a recommendation based on that. It could be the master plan update committee. So I, I think that that's a very consistent idea with how this is perceived. And then uh, to Pat's point about shortening it, I would love to see your edited version of that because it does look like the, you know, the whole store and that would be nice to, I mean, it, I think that there are ways of tightening it up so it doesn't become too diffuse. Andy? I guess the one thing about discussion of master plan is, is that we really need as a uh, council to understand, and I'm not the one who can do this, um, the relationship with the planning board mm -hmm. because right. planning board is statutorily required to be the ones who develop a master plan. Right. And in the, when you read the charter, uh, the role of this body is um, actually unusually strongly stated for many charters, but um, it doesn't place us in the position of developing a master plan. It is a question of reviewing and seeing whether we endorse or support. I forgot what the exact words are right now. So uh, I just wanted to, to put that out. Um, but I think that there have been a lot of good points raised today. I don't think we're going to solve it as we didn't last week solve a committee problem uh, and uh, somehow um, ask the president to consider whether there's some way we can get this back to a group that can produce some further work before it comes back to the council at the next meeting or thereafter. 
comments? I, I'm thinking an ad hoc committee, and rather than send it to governance organization and legislation and get into that round that we did before, I'd rather have a ad hoc committee that meets to really hone in on this charge before we look at structure and stuff like that. Alyssa. I can certainly support that, but one of the things that, you know, without us actually having a template, and we've discussed some variations on that and, and governance, organization legislation is obviously looking at that more deeply. But one of the things we've been trying to incorporate thus far are things like action steps, reports, town council actions, and none of that is addressed yet in this format. And so if I had a better understanding of what folks were actually going to do on this committee in terms of who they were going to be talking to before they talked to the council um, and how often that was going to happen and under what focus, I would feel a lot more comfortable with it. I understand it does not wish to just be although one variation is a master plan implementation committee, it does not wish at this point to be simply reactive to things that are happening, yet I can't grasp a situation where a bunch of people are excited about talking about turning the fire station into a, an art center, and that's a focus of a committee that's a town council standing committee when we have a, literally a hundred other things that we have to do before we have that discussion. We can't be spending our time on that discussion to the exclusion of other conversations, even though it's tied into economic development and other issues. So I'm just a little worried about the reality on the ground of what this will do, and maybe if it's beefed up a little associated with what the reporting would be like, what the info gathering would be mm -hmm. like, what the expectations were, like how often it was going to report back to this committee on things that didn't get referred to it by the committee, but that grew out of its own heads, um, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, Evan. So one thing that I want to, um, I'm thinking about is making sure that this committee uh, isn't duplicating the efforts of any other committee. Um, so Mandy Jo brought up the idea that what does it mean to advise the town council with regard to design review when we have a design review board? Uh, what does it mean to advise the town council um, on historic preservation when we have a historic com commission? Uh, looking at the last paragraph about uh, relationship between town and educational institutions, what does that look like um, in the context of, say, UTAC, right, or maybe a revived UTAC? Um, and so I'm hearing some concerns that maybe this is too broad, what's this going to do? And I think maybe a starting point for that is to think about uh, constraining this where we don't want it to duplicate. Because I understand the desire to analyze research and review recommendations for the chaining by zoning bylaw, but we also want to make sure that when the planning board puts forth proposals, we're not doing the work over again before it goes to the council. Pat. Um, initially, we were talking about this as being an advisory committee, not a committee that would take away power from the council, but would add to the information and, um, that the council had to make decisions. Um, so I, that feels like an important point to me. And, there, and what would we be advising on, and how far would we go in our research, um, I think are important questions. Shalini. I'd like to, I was just curious also, what is the outcome we want to see? You know, let's say if we do everything this committee wants to do, like in the ECAC committee, our goal is, you know, reducing carbon emissions, or green gas, or whatever, the green gas, uh, greenhouse gases, yes. And so what is that goal that we are moving towards in this committee? Thank you. I'm going to suggest we form an ad hoc committee, that that committee, um, so let me just move that, that we, the council form an ad hoc committee to review and refine this charge, answering some of the questions, many of the questions that have been raised tonight. It's a motion, do I have a second? George, uh, George was over there first. 
Um, yes. Can you repeat who made the motion? That we form an ad hoc committee to look at the charge of the Community and Economic Development Committee and refine it in a manner that answers many of the questions raised. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that? Yes. Just from a process perspective, is there a, I'm trying to think, so the ad hoc committee would work on this and bring it forward to the council, but it still has to go through GOL. And so would we bring it to the council, have a full discussion, and then again, and then refer to GOL? Or is there a way to maybe do these that once the ad hoc committee is done, it just automatically goes to GOL? I think that that would be a wise plan, to have it go to GOL or have GOL give you the format and the issues they want addressed. Yes, Dorothy. Um, one of the things that the ad hoc committee could do is to uh, research similar committees from other towns, because that's one of the things we found out from the MMA, that most towns have such a committee, and it's a very important committee. And I think we would say, what do you do, okay? And how do you do it, and how do you do it so you don't duplicate? Okay. Other comments, questions, Dorsey? Uh, I would just say from my experience with the ECAC that um, we may want to assume that there's going to be a few more drafts. And I, so we might not want to send it to the, G, the GOL committee right away because we want, might want to wait till we get to the last draft. But it's up I, to no, the committee. I, it might have to go back. I mean, it might have to go back again. I'm hoping that the committee itself can come up with draft and maybe second draft and whatever. And so that, and, and then if we could ask the governance organization and legislation committee to say, this is the format we want for committee, you know, charges, that it can be put in that form. There are going to have to be issues that you will need to discuss, including the makeup of the committee, the terms of the committee, and so forth. We've been through this more than once now. We've been through it once. And so there's some learning curve that I think we've benefited from all of that. Any other comment? Call the question. Can I we, oops, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, do we know who the committee is? We haven't, no. So we, we're going to approve the committee and then we're going to create, create the committee and then I appoint. So this is how a committee appointed by them? Yeah. Okay. It is. Um, Mandy Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. And okay. my vote is a yes. Okay. This is a roll call vote and I'm going to ask the town clerk to call the roll. Uh, Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. And Councillor Swartz? Yes. The vote is unanimous. Okay, and now I would like to see a show of hands or a voice, if because <laughs> I can't see a show of hands. Of those counselors who are interested, I will appoint five of you because that's kind of our standard ad hoc committee at this point. Um, so may I see a show of hands of people interested in being on this committee? Mandy Joe, are you putting your hand up or not? I am not putting my hand up. Okay. <laughs> All right. No. I, why? Um, okay. First of all, Dorothy and Steve, definitely. You don't. Well, then I think Pat. Yeah. Well, I thought there were too many people. There are. Um, 
and it's a hard choice, although I know what Kathy's going to be facing with budgets, so I'm actually thinking about this. Um, and this does not mean you can't give suggestions. Yes, shall I? It's Chen. Oh, oh, yes. Since this is an ad hoc advisory yes. committee, could we have an even number? Because, yeah. you know, we're making a suggestion to the council, and it's good. Could you have an even number? Because it's Andy, an Joe, ad can they have an even number? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say yes. All right. So, Shalini, Pat, George, and Kathy, as well as our two original authors. I'm even taking myself out of that because forget the fact that I wrote the original one. No. And, and um, no, I'm not on it. No, then that's a whole meeting. Um, okay, let me just repeat. The people who are on this ad hoc committee are Dorothy Pam, Steve Schreiber, Shalini Balmilne, uh, uh, Pat DeAngelis, George Ryan, and Kathy Shane. Okay? Thank you. We're moving on to the next agenda item. Um, and we actually took action on that one. The next agenda item is, in fact, the Energy, Climate, and Action Committee. Uh, there is a proposal before us of the actual charge, and I'd like to have us move directly to that charge of that committee and have it placed in motion. Some, I'm placing, placing it in motion. I'd like somebody to place the charge in motion. It, how, when are we hearing the report? Um, it's, it's I think the report the is, in fact, the charge in this case. Pardon? The report is the fact, the, is the charge in this case. Am I giving a report? <laughs> no, we're not going to vote the committee out of existence. Into, into. Oh. into existence. <laughs> we already did that. I'm sorry? Evan, yes. I move to approve the charge of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Okay. Is there a second? George, thank you. Are there other, are there comments regarding the charge? Discussion. I'm, con I'm confused. <laughs> uh, I have on my agenda here, a report from the ad hoc committee and then the council motion and vote. The, uh, Dorsey, the report needs to go back to the committee to be edited and before it comes to the full council. It needs, the report always needs to go back to a full, the, the committee that it was, came from to have comments and edits before it can come into the council. And this, at this point, that has not happened. So um, we're going to not do the report, but stick to the motion of the charge. So we're focusing on the charge. Kathy. I just have a question on what I'm looking at. Okay. okay. So I'm looking at what I think is a revised charge that has color codes in it. And am I reading it as this is the revised charge rather than these are areas we have questions or these are already these are already areas that people have worked out and we are we getting and then my second question are we getting a consensus document or was there still some disagreement on what we're looking at and I, I, I don't know the answers to that. Okay, let me ask, let me stick to the first question. Is this, is this charge before us with the turquoise and all of the yellow, the charge as it stands coming out of the committee? 
Yeah, so yes. let me just provide yes. a 30 second explanation. Uh, the charge in front of you uh, has two colors. The blue is what we voted on as a full council at the January 28th meeting. The yellow uh, are, char are revisions to the charge that were voted on and accepted by the ad hoc committee. So this is the final charge. Uh, the yellow is not intended to be areas of discussion. Those are changes from the last version that you saw, um, but they reflect uh, the votes of the ad hoc committee that was tasked with revising this. Darcy. So the, um, the, the, the committee met on two different days and um, basically came to consensus on seven of the issues um, and then we voted on three. Uh, which you saw in that draft report that hasn't been approved, I guess. Um, so uh, the, the three issues were uh, whether or not the... The three issues uh, that were voted on were whether or not the, um, the town councilors... Um, term was one or two years, and that uh, ended up being, uh, Steve vote, uh, moved for the term to be three years, and we voted unanimously that that should be the case. Uh, the second area in which we didn't have consensus was uh, that Mandy Jo um, moved to amend Section 2B to require that emissions reductions goal dates recommend to the town council other than those required under the 100% renewable energy goals be only those adopted, in quotation marks, adopted by the town council. So that was to require that any new goal dates uh, be for uh, items that had already been decided to be goals by the town council. And the third area um, was a motion by Mandy Jo to um, amend section four to remove the list of possible programs and policies. Um, and that was um, uh, initially, we discussed changing it to Concord's list of um, programs and policies, and then we discussed uh, adopting the list that Steve had suggested earlier, um, and ultimately voted for two, one, to adopt that. Uh, so, uh, Basically, that's where it stood. The, the, uh, the three motions were voted in the way that I just said. So, uh, uh, despite the fact that the, the charge has been wordsmithed to death <laughs> in uh, like four hours of the governance committee and at least four hours in the town council and uh, at least about four hours in the ad hoc committee and a, a more than an hour in the temporary rules committee. And it had um, at least 20 final drafts. Uh, we met uh, with the town manager a couple of times, with the president several times. And even with all of that, uh, I still think that the, the charge that we came up with is a very strong charge um, capable of positioning Amherst as a leader in climate action. Um, it has a very strong, clear purpose and requirement uh, for long-term and interim goals um, for both greenhouse gas reduction and climate action in general. Um, I hope very much that uh, in not that long a time, because of the outreach and education that we have done, uh, residents from all sectors will have buy-in uh, for the work of this committee. 
Are there any other comments, George? I think in honor of our, our 260th uh, birthday, is that correct? Yes. As the town of the book and the plow, it's time to get this horse out of the barn and out into the fields. <laughs> So let's Excellent. please pass this and <laughs> let these folks get to work. Andy. Okay, so um, just going through this, it, my comments are and questions are um, fairly specific. On the, but one thing that I don't understand is the term of appointment for three years. Um, I just don't see how that works with the council that is elected for two years. And I also think that it's important that as a new council is elected every two years, that that council have the ability to appoint its own committees and not be left with committees that were appointed by a prior council. Um, so that's one subject that I was very concerned about. There are some um, typographical things in here that I will skip commenting on. Uh, but we'll point out to, to, for editorial purposes if asked or later. Um, another question that I have is on page two in the list under subsection four, I um, would like to know what built environment means because it's not a term that I'm particularly familiar with. And uh, I think the last thing is, is that uh, the SME status is actually, this is gets to editorial things again, but the SME status is mentioned at the beginning and at the end and uh, with the blank there. So I, uh, therefore, am not sure that it's necessary in both. <coughs> okay. Yes, Steve. So I, I feel like the guy that hit the Je Jeopardy categories that he's been studying for. But so the, the answer to the three year, um, question is that just seem like the best possible way to describe the terms. So this is a, not a committee of the council, it's a committee of the town. So the, um, what we're saying is that two members of this town committee must be councilors, the other seven must be residents, some of which may have these expertises. So why not treat the councilors and the seven other residents the same? So. Um, everyone gets a three-year term. The staggered terms to begin with will be one, one third will get a one year, one third will get two years, one third will get three years. Uh, people move in town, they move out of town, they get bored with committees. So people go on and off committees all the time. So if a councilor um, doesn't win election or wants to go off the council, they resign, their term, their, their term, somebody else takes their place. I mean, this is a very common practice on all of our boards in committees, and also, quite frankly, it's the only possible, every other variation didn't work, like, because we need one at stagger terms, then the two years didn't work. I mean, it just, nothing else worked. So this is the only, in my estimation, this is the only possibility that worked. Also, it's, so, so it means that the, the two counselors that go on, one will likely get a two-year term, the other one will likely get a three-year term, so there'll be some continuity, or possibly they'll both get three-year terms, it's up to the, town manager. So the built environment is a term of art that basically means anything that is human constructed. So it could be buildings, it could be roads, it could be parks that are designed, it could be a golf course. So anything that's human constructed by humans, as opposed to, well, it's opposite, it's the natural environment, but then there's a whole area in between. Maybe I shouldn't have said that last part. I can possibly explain the SME status, which is part of our whole charge issue and the fact that we don't have a standard template for it. But the reason it's mentioned at the beginning is because whether or not it should be available, the reason it's mentioned at the end is to show that whether or not we voted on it. So it shouldn't be there three times. It should be there two times. Hopefully it's there two times. Um, but this will be clear when we have little lines and things like that on our charges. I still am concerned about the terms and I realize and appreciate that a different group worked on this and that I just keep harping on this every time we talk about it here, but I don't agree with having the town council terms be longer than one year. I, it totally works to give town councilors only one year terms. There's no conflict with the fact that they're one, two, and three year terms for the initial non council residents 
and it just feels more appropriate to me given that almost all, if not all, certainly all that I have anything to say about terms will be one year when they're appointed by the president. I realize this is not a presidential appointment. It is a town council appointment, but I don't understand going beyond, or, or it's a town manager appointment. That needs to be right. super clear. But at any rate, it's all the town manager. But to have it be longer than one year just for a town councilor just doesn't make sense to me, given that I feel that as we all have developed all our committee commitments, that every year we should be looking and saying, OK, well, now it's time for the president to survey us again to find out who wants to be on JCPC and who wants to do this. Oh, a counselor serving on this. Because if you're not serving as a counselor, then you you should be serving as a resident. Well, you can't be both. So you're a counselor first. And to me, a counselor gets a one-year term on a committee. Um, I, I have a question about the use of the type of committee being standing. It seems to me that this is not a standing committee. It is a regular committee, or what is the term we should use? Can, uh, Yes. It, maybe Mandy Joe actually has a better answer to this, but this is still a term of art that needs to be worked out by governance legislation. When you see a later charge this evening, depending on what hour that is, um, you will see some, we've now retitled a particular committee, a standing committee of the town council. Standing is a term that's been used as opposed to time limited or ad hoc. Now that we have standing committees of the council, that's a whole new concept that never existed under the former form of government. So people were just using standing to mean it doesn't okay. end after a certain period of time. So we need a new term of art for that so governance GOL probably. So has this is not a standing committee of the council? No. OK. Evan. So govern, oh, actually, Mandy Joe wants to say something. So she's probably going to say what I was going to say. Mandy Joe. Yeah, so I, I am going to address it as chair of governance. The governance committee had gotten as far as sort of type and legal reference and decided that the type would refer to, as Alyssa was saying, whether it's a standing or ad hoc for any committee, not necessarily just town uh, committees of the council, that standing would refer to a committee that's intended to exist for a long time. Ad hoc is something that is time limited. And that the legal reference line would be the line that indicates whether it's a committee of the council or a committee of the town. Um, we hadn't quite gotten to discussing whether we wanted to put that also specifically, those words, committee of the council, committee of the town, into the type, as Alyssa was saying, one charge coming through tonight will say standing committee of the town council, I think. Um, but, but the standing ad hoc was to reference a timing of it, not whether it was council or town. And is the section 2.5 the one that allows us to just create committees that are not standing? Not standing committees of the council, excuse me. Yes. Okay. So I've clarified that question. I do have one other question, and that is when councillors serve on these committees, are they speaking for the council? If, if that's coming to me, um, the governance committee wouldn't have discussed that yet. Can, can I ask? Kathy? Uh, I'll ask the same question with JCPC. When we're on JCPC, are we speaking for the council? Fair. You know, in other yep. words, I mean, we have some other places that we get slotted in, mm -hmm. so. Alyssa. That's absolutely the intention with things like JCPC and BCG. Those bodies don't work correctly and have not worked correctly in the past when people have considered themselves representative in a general sense like jury duty as opposed to taking information back and forth to what was often referred to as their home committee. Mm -hmm. And you're and the only reason you're there is not because you've been a town councilor, it's because you're talking back and forth to the town council. Yeah. So that's true for JCPC and BCG. Is that true? Is That's, an excellent I, question there is a difference. Those others are all elected bodies coming as representatives. Yes. So I, my question still stands. Steve. Well, this committee will this committee will have a chair. So the chair, but that's not your question. So mm -hmm. my opinion is that the two people are that are serving as counselors would be no different than a person who's um, on the on it because they have expertise 
in net zero energy buildings. So the person on net, who has expertise in net zero energy buildings wouldn't be speaking for all net zero energy buildings. They'd be speaking from their own expertise. And so the two counselors would be speaking from their particular perspective of maybe knowing what the poll, having an aerial perspective of what's happening in the town, but I think only the president speaks for the council. Well, the council, the, only the council speaks for the council. And if, unless the council has voted a position that this, that the counselors on this committee would take forward, can the counselor, can the counselors on this committee in fact then speak for the council? And the reality is they can't. So they can be of the council, but they cannot speak for the council unless the council has made a decision on something. They can be a liaison back and forth to the council, but Alyssa? I am belaboring this because this is why I didn't want counselors on this committee to begin with, or I wanted it to be a standing committee of the council. I think it's a mistake to have committees that have town councilors whose role is not to be a conduit back and forth to the town council. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have several discussions on the floor. We have a name of a committee, and I think that's at this point fine. We are we all agree that it is a standing committee meeting, but not standing of the council. Of, it is a standing committee of the town. It's an ongoing committee of the town. Um, two, two major questions that have been raised. One is the three-year terms. And then the second really is not in the charge itself, but it's basically inherent in the charge, and that is the counselors being on the committee. So I think we should deal with the um, three-year terms. Is there a motion to amend this regarding the three-year terms? Yes, Shalini. For, uh, I mean, do the motion and then the discussion, because I just wanted to respond what was the reasoning, one of the reason, reasons why we chose the three-year term. Please, yes. Um, we've, I guess, we felt that um, that a counselor would need two years at least to work on this. Some of this work, you know, if they're starting out and it, some of the work is going to take more than a year and it would be, it's not fair for a counselor to have that uncertainty that after a year they may not be appointed. So anyway, that was my reasoning that having at least a two-year commitment that mm -hmm. they can really do their best in two years at least to get the things rolling. Right. So. Okay. I mean, if there's not a motion to change it, it just means that when, if a counselor is no longer a counselor and they're still in their three-year term, they cannot complete that term. And we are already, even though we sit for three years and one month, actually in 27 days, uh, 28 days, um, future councils will only sit for two years. So it's, they, the, this can come back for changing at any point in time. Is there anybody that feels strongly enough on the three year issue that they need to make a motion at this point? Okay. Then I don't see on the other issue of counselors being on it, is there anybody that wants to bring that to a motion at this point. Okay. Are there any other questions to be raised or in an amendment process at this point? Andy? Yeah, it's not an amendment process, so I don't want to put it out there in that fashion. Um, I do think we should get, consider this whole thing about um, calling any committee we create a standing committee, simply because if you look through the entire list of committees that has been handed off to us and that has existed for eons in the town, um, there's never been the concept of a standing committee. You create a committee because you're creating a committee and you feel a need for the committee. If it's a 
term limited committee, that's an exception, and it's very specifically stated. The one that um, is most recent that I can recall was Downtown Parking Working Group, which was specifically given a responsibility that was um, for um, a limited time and less extended. So, uh, you know, by, um, it's, it's just a matter of consistency with all of the committee charges that we inherited, uh, unless we're gonna go back and change every one of them to use the word standing, they're all assuming the word standing just because of their existence, unless otherwise stated. All right, so we're not at this point going to actually change how this is written. However, we may at some point come back and do a whole review of what we, how we refer to different committees. It's something I think the charter has started but not finished, okay? Um, any other questions, amendments? Margaret. I would just ask that in the original motion, the words as presented be added to the original motion so we're clear for the record that it's the charge that was brought forth tonight. Okay, that is a friendly amendment, yes. And the second person seconded, okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you, because <laughs> if you didn't, I would. Um, I call the question, all those in favor, this will be a roll call vote. Councillor Brewer. No. Councillor DeAngelis. Yes. Councillor Dumont. Yes. Councillor Griesmer. Yes. Councillor Haneke. Yes. Councillor Pam. Yes. Councillor Ross. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Yes. Councillor Shane. Yes. Councillor Schreiber. Yes. Councillor Steinberg. Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. The vote is 12 to 1. Thank you. We were going to have public comment, but I didn't take it. I don't think we need it. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. We've had public comment, and it lasted for a few seconds of applause. Um, all right, we are moving on to... Um, the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee. Uh, no, actually the ad hoc committee has to go through one more round of exercise, and that is to approve their minutes and to approve their committee report. Okay, and until such time they do, we are not going to dissolve the committee. They can do that by sending things to one person and not debate online, okay? Um, the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee uh, is the report of the committee. Sarah. Do you want the report now before we do the motion? Because I just noticed that it's also number eight, That so I don't know, it, mine's very brief, so. Why don't you just report on this motion at this point? Okay. Um, So the, the motion before you would be to amend the charge of the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee. Um, the comment that I would make on, on that is the, simply the changes that have been made. Uh, one, we did change our name um, because if we didn't, then we would have, our acronym would be the same as the Council on Aging. So we did change our name to the Outreach Communications and Appointments um, Committee. And the, the only changes to our charge were you have a, the original and then you have a markup copy that simply was, um, there was no change in the context. It's just to meet the requirements of making sure that our charge is the same as the other charges that have been put forward. Okay, so the motion's been made. Is there a second? George, seconded. This, that's to accept the charge. I'm going to have Sarah being the person that did the motion. George is the second. Any further discussion? 
Call the question. All those in favor? Uh, we have to do roll call vote. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. The vote is unanimous. Okay. Uh, the next item on our budget, I mean on our budget, <laughs> next item on our agenda is the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I categorize this um, as a kind of cleaning up our um, act, if you will. And it comes, and I've shared with each of you the um, email that has been sent out, although we have made a change in the reference to the charter in that email, and it is in your packet. Basically, this is to extend the appointments of four members, of four people in, who are acting as members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and have been doing that since December 3rd. And their appointments were initially extended by the Select Board back in May, and this now extends it to June 30th, 2019, um, and particularly because that would give us time to go through the process of appointing a Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there, I pl I, so I'm placing in motion to appoint the following members of the Zoning Board of Appeals to comply with the Amherst Home Rules Section 10.70, all the term, all with terms to expire June 30th, 2019, Keith Langsdale, Joan O'Meara, Mira, uh, Thomas Simpson, and Stephen Judge. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion or questions? Call the question. This is a roll call vote. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. The vote is unanimous. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, appointments. And the uh, only item under that is a town manager appointment. Mr. Bachelman, would you like to speak to the appointments? Uh, yes, thank you. So in, in your packet I've and filed with the town clerk today. Simultaneously, I refer to you appointments uh, for the Community Action, uh, Community Preservation Commission. Um, the appointments you have in front of you um, are the recommendations that have been received from the various committees that are required by our bylaw. Uh, these are the committees said these are the people we'd like to have represented, um, and those are the ones that are in front and in front of you. I can I could read their names to you if you'd like. Um, David Williams from the Amherst Housing Authority, Fletcher Clark from the Conservation Commission, Robin Fordham from the Historical Commission, Sarah Marshall from the LSSE Commission, and Michael Burtwistle from the Planning Board. So in other words, these are committees that were asked who they would like to appoint. Yes, and each committee took action to recommend these. And each committee took action to recommend. So, in fact, these are not town manager appointments. They technically, technically are. Technically, they are. Okay. And that's why it's, but we honor okay. the request from the committee, and it goes to you for your review as well. Okay. So, there are two options here. One is to um, make these appointments, and the second is to refer this to the Communications out new name. Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Yes, Alyssa. So I have two questions. One is I did not get a chance because we just got this today to go back and go through our minutes of previous referrals, but it had been my belief that because this committee of outreach communications and appointments was established, 
that this no longer needed a referral every time it came to the council, that things were just going straight to us. And while they could certainly get additional attention by being mm -hmm. reported out at this commit at this mm -hmm. council meeting, it might be that the town manager wanted to make appointments some week we're not having a meeting and would not need to hold on to that. And so I'm unaware of why there would need to be a motion to refer it to OCA unless the idea was we would go ahead and simply agree to it because of the unique nature of these particular appointments, which is to that they are sent by what I referred to earlier tonight as home committees, which then leads me to one more comment associated with that, which I utterly object to, as I have stated to every committee who ever brought forward CPAC appointments in the past, that unless they can point to why this is true in this Community Preservation Act law that we accepted as a community many years ago, it does not make any sense to me at all that the person's term would be coterminous with their term on the sending body. So for example, Amherst Housing Authority appointments used to be five years long. And so to say that for five years that person's going to serve on the Community Preservation Act makes no sense to me. That seems like the sort of thing a committee should be looking at every year mm -hmm. and, and sending that forward again because you need to rebalance who's doing what on any individual committee. So as it turns out, most of these dates are either 19 or 20, which would be a one-year appointment, but there is one on there that is much longer and it just simply doesn't make sense. Again, unless it's a technicality in the Community Preservation Act law, which is rather burdensome in the way it's rather detailed. We didn't just pick these committees out of the air, they come out of the law. Um, but I don't believe we need to have it be coterminous with that end. And we've had problems in the past with bodies who have appointed a person to serve that. They've been appointed to serve for their, like, their three-year term on the body then they've stopped showing up, then it's become awkward for the committee to throw that person off, and then they're not showing up at the Community Preservation Act meetings. And so if you just do it on a year-by-year -year basis, then it's simplified. So that would be my recommendation to the housing authority in this particular case, that they understand that it would be for a year, that it's not up to them to say when it ends. But that's been a previous discussion. Comments? Yeah. So the option is to accept these or to refer. I have to say that given the fact that the individual bodies have already made their nominations, I found it less compelling to refer, but that's, if the, um, I have to get the name straight. Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee wants to have it be automatic referral, then we can make it automatic referral. Shalini? I think it would be helpful for me to have a sense of what is the charge of the OCA committee. So, I mean, what is the, their role and with respect to appointments? It's, yes, Andy, please. Yeah, I think that uh, maybe I should respond to that and put that into the context of why we probably ought to go ahead and act on this tonight. The Community Preservation Act yeah, Committee funny. exists as a matter of state law that if we've accepted the Community Preservation Act as a community, which we have, that there has to be a committee such as the one that we're talking about that review, that obtains proposals and then reviews proposals and makes recommendations for funding to the legislative body of the community, in this case, the council. And, uh, then when the council receives the proposal, uh, we have the, um, options available to us to accept, um, reduce the amount, but we do not have the ability to create our own proposals that have not previously gone to the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, having been the liaison for several years from uh, 
the select board to this committee, which was a non-voting member. I just observed the meetings. They worked really hard, and there's a lot of thought that goes into the process, a lot of time that goes into the process of reviewing the applications and um, asking questions of the proposers uh, who've, who've submitted proposals and thinking very hard about how um, they um, can propose the best allocation of what is always less money available than money requested. And <clears throat> the um, CPAC this year has already begun some of that work and um, I think that we would be um, not serving the purpose of the committee well if we don't go ahead and confirm the appointment so that the people who have been actually meeting with the committee but are not voting members can actually complete the work that they have already engaged in. Uh, so it's a long answer to the question, but it gets to the point that I support our make, uh, making the decision tonight to confirm these appointments as uh, recommended by the manager. So is that a motion? I will make that a motion. Yeah. Okay. okay. Second. Okay. Further discussion? Pat, did you have a question? I just had a comment. Um, it seems to me that, uh, as uh, Alyssa said, that these, it's very, and Andy also, this is a very special kind of appointment mm -hmm. that we can pass it through, but it's also critically important to me that we uh, refer any town manager um, you know, recommendations uh, to the Outreach and Appointments Committee and that they have information about the pool of applicants uh, for these committees. Of which there wouldn't have been a pool in this case because no, they were audited, that. right, yeah. Yes, Sarah, please. So I don't want this to be redundant to what Pat said, um, but yeah, just to, to, to answer to Shalini, the reason why that we the reason that we exist is to make sure that we have a decision tree, a process for all appointments, and that we have a process that's transparent and easily understood and can be followed each time. So while I, I do understand that we're saying what we're saying about this committee, um, I, I think that appointments should, should go through us. When, let me just clarify. Even in the case where they're identified by bodies other than us and other than the town manager per se, I think in, in this particular case, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I guess I wasn't clear. I'm acknowledging that in this case, that they were. I think that 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 is okay in this particular case is what I was trying to say. Right. Although I do want to give credence to, which we're, when we look at at terms, I I think that. That's something that's important. Right. At some other point, I would suggest that the um, Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee actually look at how we've set up these terms, but not necessarily at this point. Yeah. Andy? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Sarah's reasoning on this. I think that. Um, there should be a practice that under normal circumstances that yes. um, all committee appointments do go through the committee the, of, of the council that's appropriate. Uh, we're sort of in an unusual circumstance in our first year of operation as a council that we're um, inheriting a government that's working and is also in transition, and this is just a special circumstance, but I don't think the special circumstance should swallow what's the sound practice for a council going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there, we have agreed as a council, I believe, that all committee appointments would go first to that committee and then come to us. So there is a motion on the floor, it's been seconded, that in this case, we actually go ahead, yes. Darcy, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that uh, we had a meeting this morning and we, um, we looked up the definition of one-off to try to see if we could find a better word, <laughs> which we couldn't. <laughs> uh, 
But um, so this is just another situation, another one-off uh, from my perspective, and that we would hope to get future referrals to the committee. Okay. Any further conversation? Call the question. Uh, this is a roll call vote on the motion to approve the town manager's recommended appointments to the Community Preservation Act Committee. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Shriver? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to committee reports. Uh, these reports can be as brief as you'd like to make them. Um, communications, outreach, and appointments. So mine is gonna be brief. Um, I believe that everyone received our um, report to read, um, so you can read it. <laughs> if you had um, you know, any questions, feel free, but I, I think the only things that have, are worth note that we have done since the last time there's been a report is that we changed our name, we cleaned up our charge, and that today, as our, uh, today as our morning meeting at 9.30, we move to appoint the following members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, ZBA, to comply with Amherst Home Rule Charter Section 10.70, with, all with terms to expire on June 30th, 2019, Keith Langsdale, Joan O'Mara, Thomas Simpson, and Steve Judge. Okay, and then we acted on that. Great. Oh, and I, and I guess I should also assure everyone that what we have been working very, very diligently on and trying to be thoughtful as well as expedient is decision trees so that we can bring you a process for all of the appointments to the, to the council. How do we handle it? We have, we have we have different decision trees and we're working really hard to do that for you. Great, thank you. Um, finance committee. So the finance committee did not have a written report because we actually have not met since we completed our work um, on the recommendation for the Station Road Bridge, which was a written report that you previously received. We are meeting tomorrow and have a tentative meeting for a week from tomorrow. I should say we're meeting tomorrow if the weather permits us to meet, and I'm assuming that it will. Uh, the uh, purposes of the meeting tomorrow are uh, largely to work on uh, the capital projects that we discussed earlier uh, to see if we can understand a little bit more about the financial elements of the proposals that are out there or likely to be out there, material that um, was presented uh, to you, but I think that the committee, uh, the, um, our finance committee needs to understand better. Uh, a second thing is that we're gonna begin to have discussions um, about how to develop a long-term plan that would encompass funding of all of the major projects that we're discussing, horizontal and vertical, as <laughs> they've been previously described to us. Um, and then the third element is to organize ourselves on how we plan to do our work for the remainder of the year and handle the various issues that are gonna be coming before us, mostly um, the um, budget, both the operating budget, the capital budget, and uh, really it's um, the consolidated operating budget for the entire community because it also includes the enterprise funds. And uh, we're gonna have to determine um, how we're going to approach that work and the number of meetings and schedule of meetings that we have going forward. So at the next meeting, I think we will um, likely have a more substantial and written report for you. The other thing that I wanted to just briefly say is that um, Kathy, who's the vice chair of the committee and I, went last week to meet with Dave Murphy, who is chair of the Committee on Finance of the Northampton City Council, because we thought that it would be helpful for us to know 
how another community works in more than just looking at paper, but actually sitting down and having an intensive discussion and being able to ask questions. And uh, Councilor Murphy was extremely generous with his time and uh, allowed us to um, sort of hear his presentation of how they work. Their charter is very similar to ours because um, they're a city as we're a city now, and so they're working on the same timetable. It also is a very similar process of how the budget moves from the executive, in their case the mayor, in our case the town manager, to the council and is considered in a finance committee. Um, I'm not going to go through all of my um, what he said because that would uh, be impossible to do. But I'm going to touch just real quick on four points and then see if Kathy has anything to add. Um, one is that uh, most of their meetings are embedded in council meetings. So when a um, meeting is scheduled, um, it includes um, a note the, to that effect in the meeting notice to make sure that that is, is appropriate and I actually did look at their meeting notices afterwards. Um, but the way it was described to us is that um, all of the councilors sit there and then uh, when the, um, it, it re adjourns as a council meeting and convenes as a, as a finance committee meeting, that the, fi uh, the finance committee ch uh, chair, Mr. Murphy, takes over and chairs the meeting, the only people who vote are the uh, members of the uh, Committee on Finance. Uh, in retrospect, in thinking about that, I think it's difficult for us to consider such an option, uh, mostly because our charter mandates that there be four members of the committee who, well, it doesn't say four, I think we've created four, we've created but, it, four. Uh, but we've, we've made that commitment now. And with non, but we are required to have non-council members of the committee, so I think that would make it a very difficult process. But his point was is that um, it is uh, financial issues are integral in everything that a council does and that it creates an understanding in a very efficient way. I think that as a uh, finance committee, we're going to have to discuss that and find how we're going to make sure that we're providing that opportunity for you in some other way. Um, the other things, just, and I'll try and be real quick on that, uh, he po we asked about what ma matters go before the Finance Committee. He said, well, any matter that has any financial impact on it, which can be lots of different things, um, but that he also pointed out that um, their practices in Northampton, that uh, matters can go before numerous committees, that it doesn't necessarily have to go before just a single committee so that um, if there's a financial impact, they may get it, but another committee may get it. He did say that if it's an ordinance, which is the equivalent to us of, a, of what we're calling bylaws, that the legislative committee is the last one to comment before it goes to the council. And he talked a little bit about the second reading process. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to just comment on is, Similar to our um, JCPC, they have a um, committee um, on capital improvements that reviews the um, proposals from the various departments. Um, it is a little bit different from our JCPC in that it is composed a little bit more solidly of staff and, has, um, and so staff has a more dominant role in that committee than ours. But the other thing that I noted was that <clears throat> their committee um, actually was re um, reviewing proposals in October and November and doing it well in advance of the process. It would, uh, and then the proposals um, go, in their case, to the mayor for review. And uh, it, it um, sort of emphasized to me a point that I had been thinking about, and again, we have to raise with the Finance Committee, is we really need to look very carefully at our schedule for the year, the annual schedule of how it is that um, we do the budget process and how the committee, the finance committee 
fits into the entire budget process. And what we just did with the Community Preservation Act Committee is another example because they have historically worked to try and get a report out by town meeting date at the beginning that was essentially I gave them an April deadline. They don't need an April deadline for what we do. Um, most cities um, that have Community Preservation Act um, have multiple times during the year where they will consider proposals and it's a more of a rolling basis. He said that they have two principal rounds in Northampton. So there's a lot of scheduling questions that I still think that we have to come to grips with as a council in order to figure out how to make this entire budget process, finance process, work most efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Kathy, did you have anything to add? No, that was very thorough. Thank you. Um, Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. Yes, um, there is no report because the GOL committee has not met since our last meeting and our last report. We have two meetings scheduled this week, um, both Thursday and Friday, to get to the rest of our work. The first thing on that agenda is the template for committee charges. Um, and then we'll re be reviewing some of the stuff that I talked about at our retreat. Um, language for clarity, consistency, and actionability, and what we actually mean by that, and some the charge itself, and then the resident advisory committee charge that has been referred to us at this point. So that is my report. Thank you. Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. Alyssa. Yes, before I give the report, might I ask that, uh, aside from the lateness of the hour, would, might we normally consider entertaining questions after each committee's report? Oh, thank you. <laughs> But Are there any okay. questions thus far? <laughs> because Mr. Steinberg answered my question that I had, so it worked okay. out perfectly. Alyssa. Our report is in your packet. It was submitted many days ahead of time. Thank you to Vice Chair Kathy Shane. She made sure that she basically documented what we decided at a meeting and turned it in immediately. So that, worked, that was incredibly efficient and you saw what we suggested tonight was put into practice associated with the public comment periods. And I very much appreciate and we appreciate the president's willingness to say, yeah, let's try something new. So we will continue to offer trials like that on a variety of issues. We have many things that we are working on in terms of all the rules of procedure that are out there in the world that we are trying to turn into appropriate Amherst level procedures. But one thing that I think would be useful to consider in your minds, governance to consider, and luckily Mandy Joe's also on rules of procedure with us, is one of the ways we might avoid some of this confusion around what standing committees are and just standing being, really it being anything other than standing, is there's, it's very typical in other communities that what we're calling standing committees of the town council are called town council subcommittees other places. Maybe, mind blown we could consider calling ourselves subcommittees, in which case that would be a lot clearer to a lot of people as to what that committee is. It's a subcommittee that's only town councilors because that's the way we've defined it. So something that we'll be talking about, again, I assume GOL may talk about and may come forward at some point in the process. Kathy. Um, I just want to add one more thing. You have it, in, as Alyssa said, you have it in the report. We also talked about the public comments we get that aren't people coming to the meeting, um, <laughs> but are sending us, and trying to work with our communi community participation officers or to figure out a way if we can capture them in a form that we can make a repository that's public. And I, we met, um, I met someone um, who came to chat with me in office hours today that said in Montana, in his community, their council puts them up and it's called public comments and there is a, by correspondence, someone's putting them up as a PDF and posting them, and the Charter Commission did this. So people will realize that they can send it to us by mail, they can send to us by email, <laughs> and it will be out there. Um, and it's, it'll require some work, but it's a way of making people feel we're really welcoming the comments, and the, the broader public will be able to see them. So this is, we have to figure out if it's feasible. <laughs> how we would do it, but I think it would be a way of being very responsive and 
people have families and can't get here at dinner time, they can still feel their comment reach the wider world as well as us. We look forward to a recommendation from the committee. Thank you. Are there other questions? Are other questions of this committee? Okay. Um, proclamations and commemorations. There are none. We're moving to approval of minutes. And let me just state for the purpose of discussion that we do send the draft minutes out to people in advance. We ask that if they have comments, they provide them directly to the town clerk by noon on Monday so that they can be corrected and put in this agenda. And the two committee minutes sets that we are, approving, are looking at today, and I'll take them first, January 28th. Do I have a motion to approve? Is there a second? So it was Pat and, and uh, Kathy. We need a roll call vote. And, oh, questions, questions. I'm sorry, questions. Yeah, actually, I do have a correction if I have the correct, um, correct set of minutes. On page three, um, in the um, first time it says voted 382, um, it, it has me voting twice, which in fact I did not do. Uh, and uh, because I, I did abstain, I did not vote for. And uh, I also was curious whether Councillor Pam was present and voted. And uh, so I was a little bit uncertain on the, on the vote for that meeting. If I may, I, I don't have um, the actual uh, video to look back at or the folder to look back at at the moment, but we will make the correction. I, I was here. Pam, Dorothy? I was here on the 28th of January. Okay. All right, so the, it seems that the one correction is that, Steve. Page seven, at of the bottom. January 28th? Uh, yeah. Okay. Page seven at the bottom, voted 11-0, but the count I think is 11-2. Okay. Any other comments or observations? That do I hear, uh, then I guess we're to call the question. So it's as amended, we're voting. As amended, yes, for, to call the question to approve the minutes as for January 28th, 2019 as amended. We need a roll call vote. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? <laughs> Councillor Griesmer? Yes. The vote is 11 in favor, two abstentions. Okay, we're moving on to the minutes of the council retreat, which is February 2nd, 2019. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move. Steve to move, second. George to second. Comments, corrections? Okay, move the um, question. Uh, I'm sorry, Shalini. It seems like there were a lot, m lot more discussion that happened than is recorded, even in terms of bullet points. So, um, we don't have a video of that meeting. Of that meeting. So, it, unless you are. I mean, there will be other products coming out of that meeting, and one of them I'm going to speak to in a moment, and that's the goals. Okay. Is that sufficient? Okay. Any other questions, comments? 
Call the question. We'll call vote. The motion is to approve the February 2nd, 2019 Town Council minutes as presented. Uh, Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Shriver? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Abstain. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. The vote is 11 in favor and two abstentions. Okay. Town manager's report. Are there some highlights from this? Yes. Um, first, I uh, want to announce that uh, students don't know already, there is an early dismissal tomorrow uh, at 1130 for the regional schools and 1230 for elementary schools uh, in anticipation of the snows coming. Um, and also beginning um, tomorrow night, there will be a snow emergency declared beginning tomorrow morning. And so all car no cars will be allowed to be parked on the street starting tomorrow, tomorrow night, not tonight, which is um, Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Um, that the cars will have to be removed. So people want to make sure people hear about that. Um, attended an uh, excellent event today with the president at Wagner Wood. Um, this was a, uh, put on by the um, Department of Energy of the, of the, the um, Commonwealth, with the Secretary and the Commissioner of Energy being there. Um, it's the Ex Executive Office of Environmental Affairs Secretary. And they announced a grant of $800,000 to Wagner Wood to purchase e the equipment to process, handle, store, and deliver dry wood including the purchase of a chip trailer designed to pneumatically deliver dried residential or commercial fuel storage silo, silos. And it was a tremendous uh, event put on by the Wagner family. They had literally um, carved a podium out of a tree it's trunk really, um, and had decorated and they had created seating out of trees that they had cut just for the event. It was, in, it was a really remarkable event. Um, the, the fourth thing was the, um, I want to thank the university um, and the cooperation for the fire and police for the Super Bowl festivities. At the end, there was about 2,500 to 3,000 people who had gathered around the Southwest dorms. Um, there was one injury. Our, um, our fire chief got, um, uh, well, there was, there's some incidents at off, off campus um, with small fires and um, people being hurt, but pretty much our, our entire um, staff responded really well and uh, really was focused on have, making sure people are in the right place. There's a lot of planning done in advance. Fortunately, we're getting used to this because we've had a lot of victories in our professional sports teams, and so they did a great job. Um, on a slightly sad note, on Sunday afternoon, uh, uh, and this is more of a warning to the public, uh, a 11-year-old boy was walking across the ice at Puffer's Pond and the ice collapsed under him. He was um, just, I don't think he went in very deep, but there were ice fishermen there that probably gave him, we think, gave him confidence he could walk on the ice, but not all of Puffer's Pond is safe to walk on. Uh, uh, police and fire responded, uh, took him over to CDH, and he was fine as, almost as a precautionary uh, measure, but an alert to the public that um, we, will, we have signs up there that the ice, especially where the channel comes in, moving water doesn't freeze very quickly, and that's, uh, it can be very thin ice, even though you might see people fishing, ice fishing in other parts of the pond, and this is true, so please be careful of the ice. Um, the uh, compliments to the LSSC and their Winterfest, they had a week, long, week of activities. Uh, Luminaria was spectacular. It brought a lot of people downtown. Uh, children loved it. This is where they put um, um, bags with um, candles in them throughout the common, and it was, it was very popular. And I talked to a number of people who came downtown just for that and then said, and then we went out to dinner. So it was a real boost for the business uh, economy down, downtown. And they concluded on Saturday with an event 
at uh, Cherry Hill, which was very well attended as well. Um, the, uh, to, uh, this week we'll be doing a mock emergency drill that the police, the fire chief is organizing uh, with MEMA and they, he will be putting town staff through their paces on a, different scenarios that will be at a tabletop exercise but say now this is happening, now that is happening, what would you do, what would you do, just to train us in terms of decision making during a crisis. It's a good thing and then we, can, we will debrief afterwards to say what went right and what went wrong. Uh, attended a meeting today as we prepare for the event that will not be named on March 2nd. Um, there will be a concert at the university. Uh, there's also a hockey game at the university. Um, and so the police and fire and the university are all working very cooperatively um, to, um, to make sure that that day goes off um, as smoothly as it has for the last three years. Interestingly, that's also the day of the four town meetings, which will be at the high school because the police take over the middle school for the most part. Um, and so we will let the other towns know that they may see a, a large number of police officers on our streets, but that's precautionary. It's nothing to worry about. Um, the downtown parking um, consultant has started uh, their work. They met with the Business Improvement District and other stakeholders, I mentioned that, and they'll be here um, again to continue to meet with the public. Um, the Board of License Commissioners has its inaugural meeting tomorrow at the same time as the um, Finance Committee, and they will be basically hearing, uh, um, being welcomed, making sure that they've done all the things they need to do to comply with being able to serve, uh, being told, discussed, having, um, talk about what their mission is and what and being given material, there, there isn't real action for them to take on that first meeting, which was our intention. Uh, we're blessed that, um, Mr. that um, Mr. Slaughter, former select board chair, is serving on that committee. He has gone through a lot of the stuff before, so um, I think that will be a, a very strong committee. And then I mentioned the Four Towns meeting and also um, I think the President mentioned that on March 7th we have a public forum on the budget at the middle school auditorium at 6.30 p.m. Oh, one last thing. Um, Hampshire College, as you all have re read, is um, going through some changes potentially. There's, um, so we're, we're monitoring that and involved with that uh, in a um, pretty uh, clear way, representing the interests of the town, because Hampshire is one of our largest employers. Um, and. Um, one of our largest landowners, and to me it's like as if um, Atkins Market said they were going to have a trouble or was going to go out of business or something. We as a town would gather around and say, what, what is the interest of our community? Hampshire has about 400 employees, about half of them live in Amherst, and the other half live in Northampton area. So there's a, a, a real economic, personal interest. Um, for people who work there that we as a community have to be concerned about. So we'll be engaged with that as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Kathy. I just have one question. Um, on page three, uh, and this is just someone noted this was in your report, um, one of my, the people of North Amherst, that the North Amherst Library study is in from Coon Riddle. And the question was, at what point will that be available if people want to see the results? Sure, we can put that, we can give that put in your packet next next meeting if you'd like, or it's, it's available, yeah. Other questions? Yes, Alyssa? One of the concerns I've had is, as we transition through our new lives here is that it appears to me that both our Transportation Advisory Committee and the Downtown Parking Consultant are excluding the Town Council as stakeholders. I'm not saying they're actively excluding us. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we're not being advised of public meetings or of surveys in the case of TAC directly as town councilors. We're just supposed to notice it. And I think that's a mistake, given that we exist and that we were elected, that we should be advised in some fashion. It's totally fine if we are not considered a stakeholder group, per se, especially if either of those groups is ever planning to present anything to us, as I believe is the case in both cases. 
But as I advised my friend who is the chair of the TAC, if you don't tell us about the survey, then when you come here, we're going to say, who got that survey? Because we don't know about it. And so I'm just asking that somehow there be some thought given to how that discussion might take place throughout the community as things like this come up. Okay. Other comments? Yes. Pat. Um, when uh, Guilford uh, was, Mooring was giving the report on uh, how we bid and build, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering if it wouldn't have been helpful if we had gotten that in advance, you know, and um, enough in advance so that we could all look at it and then um, just bring our questions because it seemed to take a long time. It was valuable, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like there, I, I, I could have done it more at home and then just asked him questions based on my understanding or lack of it. Okay. Other questions, comments? Okay. Yes, Paul. So um, I'd like to address that uh, because that was a conversation we had and in fact, he noted that there were a lot of other slides that we did not go through. I think part of it is for your education, but also part of it is for the public education as well, because we think um, as you start to consider significant decisions, um, your constituents are going to want to know the context that you're making those decisions. So sometimes, you know, we don't go into a lot of detail. This is one, it seemed like uh, people needed to know we are here, and that, that was the reason for it. And if it was too long, I apologize yeah. for that. No, 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 it wasn't too long. Um, but, and I thank you for that explanation because I wasn't thinking about the public. Okay. Yes, Shalini. Can we congratulate you for being nominated for the MPO? <laughs> congratulate me. We don't have the results that, so we don't know whether it was successful. No. I, that, it was just a nomination, right? Right. It's one of three. Darcy, yes. Uh, I have one more question for Paul, um, and that is, um, in your report, you said something about be coming up with calculations about the school project uh, by the 25th or something like that, and just wanted, wanted to know if you could explain what that's all about. So the, the, the goal is to have a presentation um, by the Capital Projects Manager, Sean Mangano, who was here tonight. He's the school business finance director as well. Uh, in terms of how those, four, those projects you saw tonight integrate with the school project and how those can look at on a spreadsheet that, um, and how they could be afforded by the town and what would need to happen for you to afford all of those projects without blowing through our tax cap, uh, which ones uh, he's got different scenarios that he's developed. They will be discussed with the finance committee first and go through it sort of as a test run to see what, um, if get feedback from the finance committee to see what would be good to provide to the uh, council. I do want to note that uh, there, I might have to, I haven't talked to the president about this yet, there might be a conflict with on the 25th for him because uh, there's another, they've changed some things that are at the school because they're canceling likely canceling tomorrow night's meeting, so I might have to talk to you about another date for that, because mm -hmm. he can't be at two places at one night. Really? <laughs> so okay. I just learned that, so I right. apologize for that. Other questions of Mr. Bachelman? Uh Then we, just in the President's report, uh, I'm not going to review the substance in the uh, minutes of the retreat, but just say that I hope to have the draft goals uh, to put before the council on at our next meeting, February 25th. Uh, these goals will help guide us and also help us measure our own progress, but then will be meshed with the town man with the goals set by the select board and form the basis for the town manager's evaluation. Are there any future, are there any questions on that? Uh, yes, when, Kathy. When, when you're talking about goals, we were, we had some conversations about first year, three and five year. Are you going to present? These are the short term ones. The short term, so yeah. what we'd hope to get done by the end of the year. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, future agenda items? Councilor comments? 
Yes, Steve. So um, I know that all counselors are interested in the built environment or vertical and horizontal construction. So the tenants in my building, which are the Department of Architecture, the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning, and the De um, Building Construction Technology Program have excellent lecture series. All of, there was a lecture tonight on what UMass is doing for sustainability. So on Wednesday night at Wednesday afternoon at 4.30 p.m., Phil Langdon, who is an author, is speaking about walkable communities. So he is kind of an expert in new urbanism, which is sort of the predecessor of what you might think of as form-based zoning. So it's 4.30 p.m. in the design building, room 170. So the street address is 551 North Pleasant. And parking is generally free at UMass on the surface lots after 4 p.m. So, but there's a PVTA stop right in front. So 551 North Pleasant. Steve, filled. which day is it again? Wednesday the 13th. Yeah. Will it, will it be recorded? Well, I'll send that to you all. I'm sorry, Shalini. Steve, will that be recorded? I think they, so it's a different department. Oops. It's a different department than mine. I do believe they record them. But um, if it's, I don't, it's not, I'll send that to the council. Kathy? I, I just want to, it, it creates a conflict with yours. I was just checking mine. But there's the TAC meeting that, Alyssa, you were saying they should liaison with us. But there is a TAC meeting talking about a broad schema of uh, transportation that starts at 5 um, um, that same day. If, um, you know, just people could be looking at it. And the other thing, Lynn, on potential future agenda items, I just don't know what <laughs> might fit. On Wednesday night later at the middle school, the Fort River feasibility study right. is talking about their results. And I think some of that will be helpful when we are looking at the school proposals. So, w one issue would be if we wanted to, if we have any room in our agendas to give them some time on our council agenda, because they actually did look at a way to do zero net energy building, and they've done alternative ways of using that piece of land. So it's both to let everyone know that meeting's happening, but it's a potential agenda item for us, um, even if we kept it to like 15 minutes. I also would like to recommend that you check out the two latest uh, conversations with Stan Rosenberg. One was by two members of the Fort River um, Study Committee, and the other one was uh, the chair of the school committee and myself talking about the school project. Both of them, I think, have now been publicly broadcasted, so they should be available on the web. Um, any other comments, questions? Yes, Alyssa? Not tonight, but at a future time, if you could clarify what you said earlier associated with the retreat results and town manager evaluation and goals and we didn't decide on a timeline for the town manager evaluation then that's still being looked right. at including by OCA and so if you could just give us a sense of what decisions need to be made when associated with that to make sure we're all in alignment and all talking to each other that'd be great Got it. thank you any other comments do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Dorothy Pam seconded. We have to have a roll call. Are you still awake, Mandy Jo? I am. Okay. And then I want to know who won the pool. All right, roll call. Counselor, Counselor. Councillor Ross. Hold on. Roll call. Roll call. Councilor yes. Ross. Councilor Ryan. Yes. Councilor Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Um, I'm going to take an hour and 15 minutes for my response. <laughs> 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 yes. Councilor Steinberg. Yes. Councilor Swartz. Yes. Councilor Balmil. Yes. Councilor Brewer. Yes. Councilor DeAngelis. Yes. Councilor Dumont. Yes. Councillor Griesmer. Yes. Councillor Haneke. Yes. Councillor Pam. Yes. It is unanimous. We're adjourned. <laughs>